Number 10, Blockbuster. Blockbuster might not be an A-list bat villain, but I don't think I've ever mentioned him on this channel before, and I thought it was about time that we gave him a little shout out. We see you, Blockbuster, we see you. While not one of the most popular bat villains, Blockbuster still packs a mighty punch. The current incarnation of the villain is Roland Desmond, who has reappeared in the Prime Earth continuity throughout the current Nightwing series. In fact, even though he started out of Detective Comics, he's now actually thought of more as a Nightwing villain. Even more recently resurfacing in Nightwing in issue 83. Blockbuster has also had many incarnations throughout the years since the character's first appearance as Mark Desmond back in 1965 in Detective Comics issue 345. Some versions have been tougher and more powerful than others, but all of them have possessed some level of super strength, durability, and stamina, usually granted to them by the Blockbuster serum, and often at the cost of some intelligence. However, the current Blockbuster does not suffer the same weakness, instead simply suffering physical pain if remaining in his transformed super buff state for too long. In a nine condiment king. Okay, before you yell at me, hear me out a little bit, okay? Condiment King may just seem like a random dude who uses ketchup and mustard as a weapon, but you have to admit that would not fit in the DCEU. The DCEU has a much darker tone than the Batman animated series Condiment King was created for, and if he was in the DCEU, they would have to make him incredibly deadly for it to work properly. This guy would basically just use allergies as a weapon, and I don't mean like the, oh, you got the sniffles and your eyes are kind of itching kind of allergies. I mean like throat closes up and eyes pop out of your head kind of allergies. They would have to turn Condiment Condiment King into such a horrific killer that he would actually end up being overpowered and probably cause a lot of controversy. Even if it was just like condiments combined with acid instead of normal condiments, that that would be absolutely nuts. You thought that they handled Doomsday bad? Wait until you see people's faces melting because they got hit with Dijon honey mustard and freaking acid. Number eight, Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze is Victor Freeze, a vastly underrated Batman villain in my opinion, but admittedly a hard villain to bring to the big screen. Though maybe not as hard to bring to the big screen as Condiment King. And that's not just because of his overall look and character design, but because of how capable he can be and how powerful he is. Mr. Freeze is one of the few Batman villains who actually possesses powers and isn't just a deranged criminal. Of course, he is still a deranged criminal. Mr. Freeze, in current continuity, is also a deranged scientist, who from an early age seemed to have a fixation with the cold and cryogenics. This fixation likely existed because of key tragic moments that had happened when he was younger, also taking place in and around the cold, such as his father abandoning him and his mother's fatal injury and later death at his own hands. Freeze would become so obsessed he would convince himself that he was married to the subject of the first case of cryogenic stasis, despite the fact that she was technically like a lot older than him, Nora Fields. But a change to the timeline would make it so that this was actually true and that he and Nora had in fact been together before she was frozen, so she became his real wife, meaning their relationship was no longer considered one of Victor's delusions in main continuity. Mr. Freeze is not only powerful with his ice gun and unique physiology, which allows him to freeze anything he touches and create ice structures, but he is complex and unique in appearance, meaning we likely won't see him in the DCEU anytime soon. Not that I'm saying the villains aren't complex. That wasn't like a that wasn't like a sick burn to the DCEU or anything, just to be clear. And it's seven scarecrow. The Scarecrow has made an appearance in the Dark Knight movies, however, those aren't in the DCEU, at least yet. Until this point, the closest we've gotten is the fear gas from the Arrowverse crossover event of Elseworlds. However, that gas made some insane hallucinations that ended up with The Flash, who at the time was Oliver Queen's speed, to be useless, which would be incredibly overpowered when it comes to the rest of the DCEU. When Oliver and Barry were fighting, Barry was landing hits on Oliver despite not having his super speed, and Oliver wasn't knocking Barry away with super speed punches. This being used on a greater scale, like we would see Scarecrow do in an actual movie, would absolutely destroy the world, especially with heroes like Superman and Martian Manhunter. And we know that this is how the Scarecrow's gas would operate in the DCEU, because thanks to the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover, we got confirmation that Ezra Miller's Flash and Grant Gustin's Flash exist in the same multiverse. Or perhaps the cinematic universe exists within the antimatter universe, so it would explain the darker themes. Either way, we know that's how the gas would work, and that would be a little too 
much to handle in one movie. Number six, Bane. Bane is known for being one of Batman's all around strongest villains, but let's not forget that Bane also brings smarts to the table. Okay, so maybe not if we're counting the Harley Quinn animated series version of Bane, but comic book Bane at least is known for also possessing a brilliant mind. A lot of people forget that about him. He was the mastermind, in fact, behind the death of Alfred, which was also part of his scheme to break the Batman in a much more all around way. Granted, he also took out Alfred because his demands were not being met. He basically ordered Batman not to make a rescue attempt, but then Damian Wayne did make a rescue attempt because he didn't listen to the warning that was given to them, and so Alfred died by Bane's hands after Damian's attempt failed. Bane being such a massive man of muscle also makes it hard to bring him to life. He's not only a hard villain to write, but he's also a difficult one to cast and depict as well, because he just looks like literally a brick house. Halfway through in number five, Arkham Knight. Not only is this character loved by some of the people who played the Batman Arkham series of games, the Arkham Knight is a highly skilled military technician who possesses expert knowledge of Batman's tactics and fighting style, which can be attributed to the fact that he was personally trained by the vigilante, being revealed as Jason Todd, a moment that we all remember, for better or worse. He is a master of hand-to-hand -hand combat, martial arts, and marksmanship. The high-tech military-like battle suit that he wears further enhances his physical strength, speed, and durability. When Batman was ambushed by the Dark Knight, he was able to knock the Dark Knight off his feet with one punch. This absolute mastery of Batman's tactics would make him a hella good villain, however the amount of power he has would probably be too much for the DCU. They already had Batman fight Superman and win, so they would have to like supercharge Arkham Knight to make it an actually interesting fight, which would just ruin the character even more than some would consider him already ruined. Number 4, Ra's al Ghul, or Ra's al Ghul, depending on what you prefer. A lot of people prefer Ra's, I prefer Ra's. We can all coexist, it's a beautiful world. Ross is one of Batman's all time greatest nemeses. While he might not possess direct superpowers of any kind, like most of Batman's rogues, he is one of the most skilled fighters and has one of the most brilliant minds. Like Bane. I like people with brilliant minds, apparently. Too bad Rage usually uses his brilliant mind to concoct all sorts of schemes in order to topple governments, sow chaos, and gain power the world over. Ra's al Ghul is the head of the League of Assassins and has come close to completely defeating Batman in the past, with him even successfully using Batman's own research during the Tower of Babel JLA story to defeat all of Batman's superpowered colleagues on the team. Getting close to the end in number three, Solomon Grundy. Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday. That's what the story says. But when killed, Grundy will return and be resurrected in the swamp where he died, and then he because, you know, that's that's his thing. This sort of resurrection and recurring antagonist thing doesn't really work in movies. In TV, sure, it can work. Introduce the character, then have them come back once a season for an episode or two. However, with movies, those are more often than not, like, one-time villains that are to be dealt with and then forgotten about, unless the movie is like a two-parter or the villain ends up winning. This kind of concept has to be taken into account when thinking about who would be too overpowered in the DCEU. Solomon Grundy would be one of those villains that wouldn't realistically be a one-time villain. Even if they brought him back for another movie with like a big team up of villains, it wouldn't matter because he would die and then just come back again. The story would never be over. The threat would never actually be fully handled, and that's just the way the character was written. It's great for comics and it would work okay on TV, but in movies, this guy wouldn't work in the slightest. It's unfortunate because I love Grundy as a character, but they would just ruin him like they did Arkham Knight and Doomsday. May I go on? Number two, Poison Ivy. Poison Ivy is one of my favorite characters in the Batman universe, period. And also coincidentally, one of the most powerful villains I think that currently exists in Batman's wheelhouse. She is brewing up something huge lately in the Batman comics and has threatened basically the entire world on multiple occasions, but also has sought in the past to remind people of why she strikes out as an eco-terrorist, at times working with international science communities and political meets to fight against global warming and work towards preserving important parts of our ecosystem. However, while Poison Ivy will be coming to the Arrowverse on CW, we still have yet to have a casting for her in the DCEU, and this could be because Pamela Isley is just too crazy complicated and OP to show up there. After all, she is proven before how hard she is to take on in the comics. When she took over the world, it seemed almost nothing initially, not even Batman, would be able to stop her. Finally, in at number one, the Batman Who Laughs. 
Being first introduced in Dark Days, the casting number one in 2017, the Batman Who Laughs was Bruce Wayne from Earth 22 of the Dark Multiverse. He was a lieutenant of Barbados, and the leader of the Dark Knights during the first Dark Multiverse invasion, and later the infected heroes of the Secret Six. He convinced Perpetua, the original creator of the multiverse, to choose him as her lieutenant over Lex Luthor, as his vision was limited by his ego. Then the Batman Who Laughs continued on with his own plans, eventually acquiring cosmic power and becoming a bigger threat than Perpetua herself. Yeah, that's right, this guy ends up gaining cosmic power. He ends up implanting his brain into the corpse of a version of Bruce Wayne who had Dr. Manhattan's abilities, giving the Batman Who Laughs near omnipotence. Yeah, this guy is the definition of overpowered. And not only that, but he's an absolute psychopath. He will gut you like a fish while your family watches and then make them play double dutch with your intestines and think that that was a boring weekend. This guy is absolutely insane. I know I said that the DCEU is dark, but this is even darker than they would go. There, in my opinion, is no way that they could introduce the Batman Who Laughs properly without making the movie rated R or literally just being unable to publish it. It's absolutely insane. So yeah, I don't think we'll be seeing him anytime soon. An attend Firebrand. A super powered enforcer for Justin Hammer, Firebrand is a former activist who turned to violence after believing leaving peaceful protests produce no results. Which sounds awfully familiar now thanks to the Flag Smashers introduction in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. First appearing in Iron Man Volume 1 number 27 from 1970, Gary Gilbert was born in Detroit, Michigan. Gary wore a suit with an armored exoskeleton that gave him superhuman strength and resistance to fire. It also housed flamethrowers, which allowed him to like shoot out, you know, fire and thermal blasts from his hands, one mounted on each wrist, and flying jets that gave him the ability to fly, which I'm pretty sure sounds familiar at this point. Except with the Flag Smashers having already been introduced and no Iron Man remaining in the MCU as a counter, Firebrand making an appearance seems a little far-fetched. It's still entirely possible, like perhaps this version gets inspired by the Flag Smashers and maybe Peter or someone has to end up dealing with them, but it would be on a much smaller scale since with all the movements, Marvel Marvel could be worried about upsetting people, and I don't think that they would handle, I don't know how they would handle this one. In at 9, Spymaster. First introduced in Iron Man number 33 in 1971, the original Spymaster was leader of the espionage elite, and they were a formidable opponent for Iron Man, and successfully infiltrated Stark Industries on more than one occasion. Man, it's like Star Labs, just walk in the front door. He's also evaded Iron Man's grasp multiple times. After his operative, Mark Sharon, was killed by the Ghost while using the Spymaster identity, the original Spymaster just let the world believe that he was dead. Others have attempted to assume the role as Spymaster, but none really did all that well. Years later, he returned to action after being found by Norman Osborn, but quickly returned to the shadows. He owned a supervillain club, and when the Avengers left Earth in order to battle the Builders, he gathered a group of supervillains and then broke in Stark Tower to steal Iron Man's technology, because the tower was basically defenseless. And while this could be plausible, seeing how Iron Man is dead so his compound would remain partially unguarded, I don't think that the MCU is going to go this route even if the character has been around for 50 years. It's actually, it was actually 50 years this January, which is kind of nuts. And it ate Blizzard. Dr. Gregor Shapanka, PhD, was an employee of Stark Industries. He was conducting private research into a means of achieving physical immortality when first introduced in Tales of Suspense number 45 in 1963. However, he attempted to rob a private vault of Anthony Stark so he could obtain microtransistor designs that Shapanka had intended to sell to further finance his research because, you know, he was trying to be immortal. And that's what everyone does when they want to be immortal. However, he was caught and unsuccessful because, you know, it was stupid. I guess he didn't have the Thieves Guild training like I do. Like, I mean, I'd show the tattoo, but I have like a full sleeve on and a suit, so I can't really, but still. Anyway, he was brought before Stark, who then fired him, understandably, because, you know, he tried to steal from him. Subsequently, Shapanka also created a suit that could generate intense cold, which he had hoped to slow his own aging process. And he then started using the suit and its abilities to commit crimes in order to, you know, get more money to fund more research, because, you know, everyone needs that villain. Doc Ock, Jack Frost, well, I mean, the news media had called this new criminal Jack Frost, which is an insult to the man who played Jack Frost in the Santa Claus 3, who, who also played Mr. Honeywell on How I Met Your Mother. Anyway, he later changes his name from Jack Frost to Blizzard, and eventually the suit comes into the hands of Donnie Gill, who assumes the title in 1987, after Gregor's death in The Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 20 in 1986. And it's seven Crimson Dynamo. Technically, in a sense, Crimson Dynamo was already introduced into the MCU. However, his actual name of Anton Vanko was introduced to 
to the MCU as the father of Whiplash, which I think just proves my point alone as to why Crimson Dynamo is too powerful for the MCU. First introduced in Tales of Suspense number 46 in 1963, the Crimson Dynamo's armor was equipped with an array of miniature electrical generators that allowed him to generate and manipulate electrical fields for a variety of effects, including but not limited to electrical blasts, electrical override, and a disruptor field that could be used to scramble electronic devices. Wonderful. The character was so strong that they had to make a new character named Ivan and make him Whiplash, who was introduced into the comics in Iron Man vs. Whiplash, but in the comics, he was also named Anton Vanko, with no relation to the Crimson Dynamo. It's just, it's confusing as hell. And it's six, Titanium Man. First introduced in Tales of Suspense number 69, nice. From 1965, not as nice, Boris Bolsky quickly rose through Soviet government ranks and became popular in the Communist Party. He had also briefly worked with Black Widow as an intelligence agent, but due to political reasons, he was assigned to Serbia. He learned that some of the camp members were scientists that had worked with Anton Vanko, who, as I mentioned last number, was the Crimson Dynamo. So Bolsky planned to make a new armor set capable of defeating Iron Man to prove the USSR's superiority over the US, because of course that's why. A titanium alloy armor was made, however, and it was much larger and heavier than Iron Man's, due to the camp lacking sufficient resources to design micro components. Because, you know, Tony Stark built this in a cave! With a pile of scraps! Bolsky was unable to defeat Iron Man on several occasions. However, I don't think this character would be introduced because they already made reference to him in the first Iron Man movie, where Stark made his suit a gold titanium alloy, which I thought was funny since people were calling him Iron Man, but in reality it was gold titanium alloy man. But like, you know, that line now makes more sense with, <laughs> with this. Plus, Tony's dead, so I don't think they could want to beat Iron Man unless they go after like Pepper Potts or something. Halfway through into number five, Fin Fang Foom. Okay, let's be honest. Most of the supervillains that heroes fight are at least similar to them in some way. Most of Iron Man's villains have some form of robotic suits like his, but less efficient. Spider-Man's are mostly animal themed. However, when Iron Man went up against an actual f***ing dragon, we all seemed a little bit confused. That's Fin Fang Foom for you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, well, he's not an actual dragon, but for a while, the Mandarin, who was working with Finn, did actually believe that he was a dragon of myths and legends. The two together ended up conquering a third of China, and honestly, that's kinda nuts. However, However, it was revealed that Finn was actually an alien and that his fellow aliens were coming to conquer Earth, resulting in Mandarin having to team up with Iron Man and War Machine to stop it. I'm sure Mandarin regretted this decision after he found out that, you know, he's an alien. I don't think the MCU is going to introduce Finn, I, at least yet. But honestly, I don't know anymore with the whole multiverse and now there's more happening and like a dragon turns out to be an alien. It's probably, it's par for the course at this point. But I think that Finn Fang Foom is a little too much for the MCU. <laughs> For Ultimo. Like I said last number, most supervillains at least base part of their persona off the hero because we all know villains just want Senpai to notice them. MatPat, I'm still waiting on you. Getting MatPat to notice me will literally be my supervillain origin story. Anyway, Ultimo is no different. However, he didn't really do this to himself. Ultimo is a giant robot created by an alien race that the Mandarin had taken control of. The cool one, not the actor. First introduced in Tales of Suspense number 76 in 1966, Ultimo only died recently in 2020, Force Works number 3 in June of 2020. While Ultimo was under his control, however, Mandarin claimed that Ultimo was his own creation. The only thing, though, that Mandarin actually created, besides changing his programming, was an artificial blue skin for the robot. Yeah. Mandarin utilized Ultimo numerous times against Iron Man, including once in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. During that battle, Iron Man trapped Ultimo beneath the Earth's crust, and as a result, the robot meandered through the planet's magma. And you know what that caused him to do? Not melt but absorb more power. Years later, when Iron Man was in battle with like a rock creature who was called the Earth Mover for some reason in California, Ultimo reemerged without his blue skin, significantly taller and much more powerful. He vaporized the Earth Mover in a second and destroyed a remote unit of Iron Man. And then, went around just destroying everything he could. So safe to say, it's probably a little too much for the MCU. Getting close to the end, in number three, Count Nefaria. Count Lucino Nefaria was the descendant of a long line of Italian noblemen, and he inherited a vast fortune. If only. Introduced in Avengers number 13 in 1965, damn, these guys are old. Nefaria was fascinated with technological advances and throughout his life commissioned scientists to create inventions that were far in advance of their current scientific standing. After allowing himself to be experimented on though, Nefaria was granted absurd levels of super strength, speed, and energy projection strong enough to make him a danger to any and all superhero teams. That's why Nefaria was introduced as a generic Marvel Universe villain in the Avengers instead of just an Iron Man rogue and has had several 
several run-ins with both the Avengers and the X-Men. And while we've had some powerful adversaries in the MCU, I think that at this point, the super strong, fast, and energy projecting Count Nefaria is going to be saved for another Avengers movie at least, or maybe even a new big bad if they get that far. But I think that it's probably going to be a, a little much. Penultimately, in at number two, the Mandarin. Okay, so while the Mandarin might technically have been introduced in Iron Man 3, he was used as a MacGuffin. The Mandarin wasn't actually a villain. He was just an actor who was covering up the actions of Aldrich Killian and AIM. Since Mandarin's iconic Ten Rings hadn't been introduced yet, which is kind of proof enough as to how the Mandarin was too powerful. And then comes the latest MCU installment, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. You've got to be kidding me. I'm actually upset that they introduced these because it totally ruins the ability to correct the Mandarin. I mean, you can't introduce the correct Mandarin now unless they end up using the name because they were inspired or something. But at this point, it's been so long that it wouldn't really make any sense. The McLuhan Power Rings grant the Mandarin insane powers, like manipulation of atomic and molecular structures, beams of force, vortex generation, disintegration beams, creating areas of darkness, lighting fires from a distance, huh? mental manipulation, electrical blasts, and intense cold and ice control. How is this not the next big MCU big bad? Because he's too powerful. They literally had to make it Kang because they're like, oh, we're gonna introduce the 10 rings, but oh no. No, no. Finally, in at number one, Temujin. Temujin is actually the son of the Mandarin, who ends up inheriting the Ten Rings, which already makes him as powerful as his daddy. However, this in combination with his ability to focus Chi to give him super strength makes him even more powerful than his father, even nearly killing Iron Man once and for all, which would have been absolutely insane. So it's safe to say that this guy has to be number one, since he literally has the same powers as the real Mandarin and then some. Hopefully they don't, they don't make this guy into an actor or something ridiculous like that. That seems just Sad. Kicking off the list at number 10, Giganta. Dora Zool made her first appearance in Wonder Woman Volume 2, Issue 126. She's a supersized villain. She's literally a giant, if her name didn't already tip you off for that. She was once suffering from a fatal blood disease, so in order to try and save herself, she attempted to transfer her life essence into the body of Wonder Woman, which I gotta say, great call. As far as vessels go, that's a pretty good one to use. Because Wonder Woman at this time was in a coma. She was being held at the experimental medical facility where Zool was working, so it kind of, you know, it was worth a shot. Now, during this process, Wonder Girl came in and interrupted it, so instead, Zool's life essence was transferred into a giant test gorilla named Giganta. I can't even say that with a straight face. So instead, Zool's life essence was now transferred into a giant test gorilla named Giganta. Oops. Now, of course, this was a no-go, so her next idea was to transfer herself again, but this time to a strong circus lady named Olga. The transfer worked and Doris could now turn into a giant because Olga apparently could do so before. I think we're okay without giants. I think anything with giants, we're just gonna keep out. If it doesn't have a cape, then no, <laughs> that's it. Number nine, Psycho Pirate. Psycho Pirate. Charles Halstead made his first appearance in All-Star Comics issue 23. He first showed up in the Golden Age of Comics. He was originally an employee of Rex Morgan, who ran a newspaper company called The Daily Career. He wanted more success, of course, so he made the alias Psycho Pirate, and he started to use emotions as a theme for crimes. That sounds intimidating, I think. So the Justice Society would solve crimes based on emotions. That doesn't sound too powerful for the DCEU. If anything, it sounds a little boring where we're heading now. The new Psycho Pirate came out in Superboy Volume 6, Issue 23, and he was much different. Roger Hayden can now control emotions, which is a big upgrade. Psycho Pirate is aware that the universes have changed. Like he saw the nature of reality die and then get reborn, like New Crisis, Flashpoint, all that good stuff. He was just stuck in the universe watching it all fold and then unfold again. The reality created by Dr. Manhattan's timeline tampering had Roger as a member of the 20, a group of metropolis citizens infected with Brainiac's psionic virus. So now Hayden can alter your emotions using the Medusa mask. He's getting better and better. The first mask was an artifact stolen from the Metropolis Museum of Art. That mask gave him godly abilities, and we see this in Superman Volume 3, Issue 24. Now the second mask used was from Batman Volume 3, and that mask was more of a tool to help him channel his own ability to change others' emotions. Medusa mask or Majora's mask? Which would you rather own? 
It's a close one. And before we continue on with this list, you know the drill. Go ahead and give us a thumbs up. If you're loving this part two, which you should be if you're still on board, those likes surely add up and help us out here at the studio, so thank you so much. Now let's get right back to this list. Number eight, Super Doom. Coming from Earth 45, this Superman was a project gone wrong. He first appeared in Action Comics Volume 2, Issue 9, when Jimmy Olsen created a machine that turns thoughts into reality. All these thought machines and emotion machines, it's a bit odd, but I like it. So the gang decided to make a robot Superman next with that machine. They ended up selling this device to Overcorp, which made it into Superman, The Last Night of Tomorrow, AKA the monstrous Super Doom. Overcorp used him to take over the planet, but still, that wasn't enough. Super Doom entered the bleed space, where he would then search the multiverse for its creators. Destroying planets and other versions of Superman, like Optiman of Earth 36 and Superman of Earth 42. But eventually it came to Earth 23 and had to go toe to toe with their Superman, President Calvin Harris. I'm all for evil Supermans in a nightmare sequence, but Super Doom might be a little bit too much. I don't know. Number seven, Relic. Ancient enemy of the Green Lantern Corps, Relic made his first appearance in Green Lantern Volume 5, Issue 21. He's been around for a while, like before space time. I'm talking like a while, while. Before all this, he was a scientist in his universe who believed that harnessing the emotional electromagnetic spectrum was a bad idea. He figured it would lead to tragedy, and given others on this list, I have to say, he was kind of onto something. So he thought all these other lightsmiths were drawing their power from a specific place, and eventually that place would run dry. Guy's a futurist, what can I say? So he searched the cosmos far and wide trying to prove his own theory, and he had universal support backing it. But nothing was jumping out at him. There was no solutions, he didn't really come across anything, until one by one the seven core lightsmiths began losing their powers. The only living being left after that war was a lone green lightsmith. So Relic then passed to the next universe, and he was remade as a giant. Kind of like Dorazul, we love giants. He was first found by White Lantern Kyle Rayner in the Templar Guardians. But he didn't want what happened to the lightsmiths to happen here, so he traveled to Oa where he warned the Green Lantern Corps that they should surrender their power rings. And they of course were like, no, get out of here, peace. And then in turn, Relic forcefully drained their powers and destroyed their planet. Either one way or another, I guess it's happening. Okay, Relic, sure. Number six. Volthoom. Making his first appearance in Green Lantern Annual Volume 5, Issue 1, Volthoom was an ancient force that had the ability to warp reality. Sweet. He was originally from Earth 15 and after his world was on the brink of destruction, so him and his mother used the newly discovered emotional electromagnetic spectrum, which is a multiversal force powered by all life in the multiverse, and then they used this power to create the Travel Lantern, and Volthoom left to find safety while his mother stayed behind and unfortunately, in superhero fashion, died right as he left. This first lantern traveled for weeks through space and time in desperate hopes to find something, something to save his home. So he goes to Earth 17 and he uses the spectrum to resurrect plant life, which is cool, but then next he travels to Earth 47 and they use the spectrum to create beautiful music, also pretty cool. And then he went to Earth 3 where he met a sorcerer named Mordu in which he creates a power ring out of a piece of his soul, that ring of course being called the Ring of Volthum. You're not gonna name it after somebody else, so it's only fair. He finally found Earth Zero where he acted as the law and order. Eventually Volthum's mind was corrupted from the spectrum and he became insane. I feel like anybody who has a ring in general just ends up going insane. Like Lord of the Rings, it's like, come on. Number five, Atrocitus. What a name, okay, he must be a gentle soul. Atrocitus entered DC Comics back in Green Lantern Volume 4, Issue 25. He is the leader and founder of the Red Lantern Corps, the Red Power Ring fueled by nothing else but rage. So since the death of his family, he's been after the guardians of the universe. His family was residing in the ever so peaceful sector, 666. Krona, one of the guardians of the universe who I talked about in part one, reprogrammed manhunters to extinguish life. So when they all went nuts, this was one of the many worlds destroyed. He was one of the five survivors left on sector 666, so together they became the five inversions. They soon became known as the Empire of Tears, which sounds like a punk rock boy band, but in reality, they were performing rituals to see the future, like the Blackest Night Prophecy and stuff like that. Atrocitus created the Red Lantern Corps, but he's also really known for corrupting Sinestro. Number four, Oblivion. Making his first appearance in Green Lantern New Guardians Annual Issue 2 back in 2014, Oblivion is made of Kyle Rayner's rage, fear, and anxiety, all rolled into one. Lovely. He's the physical form of all those traits, and he even believed himself to be Kyle Rayner. 
He stayed at this guy's apartment and he even tricked Carol into thinking that he was the real deal. He has powers that allow him to shapeshift, obviously, but he can also teleport and project vast amounts of energy that match a white lantern. He can also create illusions of objects and people. He can make anything he wants. You're gonna be very confused if you go on a dinner date with this guy. One day, Oblivion teleported Carol and himself to Arizona, where he used his powers to change everybody's appearance, and he even changed buildings all around him. No thanks, we don't want any of that in the DCEU. Sounds fun, but sounds kind of unfixable. Number three, Mongol. The insane ruler of war worlds. Yeah, he's for sure making this list. He first appeared back in the 80s in DC Comics Presents issue 27. He first appeared back in the 80s in DC Comics Presents issue 27. He was a Superman villain who was exiled into outer space by his own people. A man called the Archimandrite came along, took it over, and from that point on, the planet was just a cruel wasteland. Mongol drifted through space and over his cosmic commute, he picked up immense powers along the way until he eventually arrived on the fifth planet of the Cygnus system where the Martian race protected the Crystal Key. The Crystal Key was the only way to gain access to the planet Warworld. So Mongol kidnapped Jimmy Olsen, Lois Lane, and Steve Lombard in order to get Superman to punch those Martians out of the way. Martian Manhunter ended up freeing Superman's friends, but by the time everything was done, they were all so low energy that they still couldn't fight Mongol, so he got the key and teleported away. It took both Superman and Supergirl to destroy War World, but Mongol ended up escaping anyways. I think I like this guy, but he might be a bit too strong for the DCEU, but hey, never say never. Number two. Kronos. If you do the crime, you're doing the time, but if you have enough time, you can plan said crime out in detail and maybe you won't even get caught for that crime. Confused? That's what time does. David Clinton first entered DC Comics with The Atom Issue 3. He's mainly a villain for Ray Palmer. Now he was a criminal his entire life, but finally he was arrested, thrown in the slammer where he had time to think. Maybe a bit too much time because then he reflected on all of his past crimes and what he would have done differently had he planned it better. And he used his skills and obsessions with timepieces to work nonstop in the prison workshop. So we learned about Crocs, time, anything, the mechanisms within them, all that good stuff. And when his sentence was up, he was released and then became a time traveling villain. He used time inspired weapons, like literally he used an exploding hourglass or a wristwatch filled with blades instead of hands. And he also had a device that could literally slow down time. And then he started going by the new name, Kronos. In the DC animated universe, he used these devices to go back in time and steal rare relics from the past. At one point, he tried stealing a utility belt from the Justice League's watchtower, but when he was interrupted, he made a break for it through a time vortex, but Green Lantern, Batman, and Wonder Woman followed him back through there. We mentioned a time guy on part one, so part two, we gotta throw another one in. It's the law. And finally, number one, Grail. We finally got to see Darkseid in the Snyder Cut, but is it too soon perhaps if we meet his daughter? Am I asking for too much? I don't know. She's pretty badass. She made her comic book debut in Justice League Volume 2, Issue 40, back in 2015. She was born at the exact same time as Wonder Woman in Divergence, Issue 1. The Amazonian assassin Marina gave birth to Grail in secret with help from Penelope and Menelipe. Marina had to defend her child because Penelope heard the prophecy from Menelipe, so apparently this child would cause mass destruction when she grew up. Okay, sure. Marina took Menelipe out, so she wasn't really a concern anymore, but after Afterwards, Marina left the mascara with her daughter, making it the first time Amazons have left the island. In Justice League Volume 2, Issue 40, Grail teamed up with the Anti-Monitor and declared war on her own father. Nice. Being a hybrid of an Amazon and a new god, she's got powers from both. It's quite intimidating. She's destroyed Wonder Woman's bracelets with Omega Beams, and she can travel through dimensions by locking onto those connected to the Speed Force. She can literally hitch a ride through time, so there's no winning this battle, either in the future or the past. Guys, those were 10 more villains, too powerful for the DCEU, but of course, there's probably so many more to talk about, so a part three is probably in the pipeline. Kicking off the list at number 10, Silver Banshee. First appearing in Action Comics 595 and in usual comic book fashion, she's immediately catcalled by some gross dudes. She literally looks like a demon and the guy in the middle is like, eh, tall broads, I love them. Huh. She proceeds to choke the life out of him because she has this fancy ability where one touch is all it takes to kill you. 
Neat. Heads up 7up would be an extreme sport with Siobhan. So she keeps on walking. She continues to a bookstore, of course, killing another dude by, you know, palming his head for a hot second. People run out of the store and they're talking about her voice, how it's the weirdest sound that they've ever heard. See, it's not her touch that kills, it's her voice. See, in IMAX, this would just be a treat. Just a woman screaming into the camera for four hours. I'll take it. Debit. She's not to be messed with. She straight up killed Superman in her first comic book appearance. This is why you try and avoid curses when you're a child, or else you turn into a silver banshee and then in turn you have no friends, which is no fun. Number nine, Knockout. First appearing in comics with Superboy Volume 4, Knockout was a dancer working at a club called the Boom Boom Room. It's clear right off the bat that she possesses super strength. But she was having fun at this club. She saw Superboy on TV and thought that he was a little cutie. In fact, she actually doesn't believe that Superboy has ever met a girl like her in his life. And she's probably right. She fought Superboy a bit because she was into it, but later on she was much more of a threat when she joined the Suicide Squad for missions against the crime cartel Silicon Dragons. Once issued two rolls around, flirting turns into something pretty serious. She's fighting Superboy and she says that she's glad that she lives here now. Here? So where did she used to live? Well, she used to live in Apocalypse. Fun fact, she was also one of Granny Goodness's female furies, but after Big Barda left with Mr. Miracle, she too decided that she wanted out. And she was punished for this, of course, so she got chained up to the walls of the fire pits, but eventually she broke free. The second she broke free, she leaped into the fire and then she was transported via boom tube to Hawaii. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up because it really does help us out quite a bit and also we're on a part three so if you want to keep seeing more of these keep hitting that thumbs up let me know what to do you're the best now back to this list Number eight, Ultra Humanite. Superman's first recurring nemesis during the 40s, and yes, I'm even talking before Lex Luthor. Buckle up. This genius made his first appearance in Action Comics 13 way back in 1939. His real name wasn't known at first, Mr. Mysterious Man, but this man was gifted with one of the greatest criminal minds ever. He even developed low-level telepathy. He was a hard thinker, but his physical body couldn't keep up, and he quickly became old and withered, so he got other people to do his deeds. That was him in the old days. Now, Ultra Humanite in Power Girl Volume 2 is much different. Here, his name is Gerard Shugel, same scientific origin, same failing body, yada yada. But if it wasn't obvious, this time around, he experimented with some animals in his origin, and he moved his powerful brain into a massive white gorilla's body. We have Gorilla Grodd in the CW-verse, so maybe we'll get a mighty gorilla genius in the DCEU. Sounds terrifying. Never say never. Number seven, Solomon Grundy. Killed in 1895 and then tossed into a swamp. Rough. Cyrus Gold was gone for 50 years before he came back to life. We're talking zombies now, let's do it. He made his first appearance in All American Comics issue 61. Cyrus was having an affair at the time and met up with Rachel, the other girl, to talk about what they're going to do now that she's pregnant. So Rachel wanted money in order to keep quiet and Cyrus wasn't on board. So Rachel's friend stepped out of the bushes, hit Solomon on the head and he fell into Slaughter Swamp, great name for a swamp, where he would then lay dead for 50 years. Over time, Gold's body started to mix with the sour vegetation of the, you know, slaughter swamp. So he was just churning and turning into a zombie. He came back as a zombie beast with no recollection of his past life. So when he stumbles across a camp, the only thing he can remember when asked his name was that he was born on a Monday. Oddly specific, but we're here for it. The other guy who asked his name mentions the nursery rhyme, Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday. Is that, could it be? And it rhymes, therefore it stays. Number six, Emerald Empress. Making its first appearance in Adventure Comics 352, the Emerald Eye of Ekron is an extremely powerful weapon. Right off the bat, I gotta talk about this. It's one of the best to ever exist in the universe. It's similar to the Green Lantern Power Ring, so when Saria gets a hold of it, trouble ensues. Originally from the planet Vengar, the Emerald Empress was the most wanted female criminal in the history of the universe. Which, I mean, put that on her resume. That's, that's a pretty big achievement. Her homeworld was the site of the long dead Ekron civilization, whose secrets were supposedly lost all for the Emerald Eye of Ekron, of course. The Eye will do whatever Saria wants it to, and it follows her around and gives her the ability to fly and hang out in space safely. The Eye fixes itself after it breaks, so don't think about hitting it with a big hammer and then calling it a day. The Eye has taken down Superboy before, and if we don't have a Green Lantern in the DCEU yet, I think it might be too soon for the Emerald Empress to start eyeballing the League, perhaps. Number five. Poison Ivy. Bridget Regan has recently been cast as Poison Ivy in Batwoman on the CW, so perhaps she could join the DCEU soon as well. Fingers crossed on that one. 
When it comes to powerful villains, Pamela Isley packs a mean green punch. She made her first appearance in the pages of Batman back in issue 181. Now she began her days as an only child to a wealthy family, hot start already, but by the time she reached college, she was studying botany. She eventually fell in love with one of her professors, Mark Legrand, and one day she went so far to steal some special herbs from a museum in order to help him with an experiment. But of course, Mark was the worst guy in existence and used that herb to poison Pamela. She of course became immune to all diseases and toxins after this. Those were her original origins. Now her post-crisis origins were even darker. Can you imagine? That professor this time around was Jason Woodrow, later known as the Floronic Man, made Pamela a test subject for experiments. So straight up torture in her origins. This made her even darker once she did get her abilities and this time around she hated men as well. So she would seduce them with her powers and make them do the crimes. She once made her boyfriend grow fun guy in his lungs while he was driving. And I couldn't think of a worse way to go. Fun guy? I'm gonna throw up. Number four, Killer Frost. Crystal Frost, the OG version, made her first appearance back in Firestorm issue three. She was a student at Hudson University who fell in love with one of her professors, only he was married, so he wasn't really interested. Crystal, after this, was upset. She was rejected, and now she wants to start hating every dude on the planet as well. Later on, she was a scientist working in the Arctic where she again was reunited with that same professor. Then she accidentally got locked inside a thermo frost chamber, and then in comic book fashion, got the ability to project waves of freezing cold air. Cool. Frozone, but with attitude. We love it. Her first goal was to take out that professor, but he was one half of the superhero Firestorm. So she was beat at first, but once she met up with the secret society of supervillains, she was able to go head to head with the Justice League. Louise Lincoln's version of Killer Frost was in Batman Assault on Arkham, and a good amount of those Suicide Squad members are now in the DCEU. So hopefully we see her soon. It could happen. She's next in line. Number three, Barbatos. Also referred to as the Bat God, hey -o, this epic force resides in the dark multiverse. Now we're getting more into the big guys, I guess. So the World Forger was set to watch over the vast universes, and while some of them held up in their own ways, there's some worlds that just were naturally unstable. So what do you do next? You get a giant stick and then poke them and push them out of the universe? No, of course not. You send a dragon to destroy it. That way the energy can then return to said forge. Not a bad gig. Now sometimes you like your job a little bit too much, you know, destroying planets and all. And this was the case for said Bat God. He ended up killing his master and that was just the kickoff. He then had a real taste for destruction and then he corrupted the forge of worlds. So now with the Bat God not destroying these worlds and sending that energy back sometimes, these worlds would end up becoming part of the dark universe. His journey begins with Dark Days, the casting issue one and it's mind bending, go check it out. Number two, Cyborg Superman. Hank Henshaw made his first appearance in Adventures of Superman issue 465. He was a scientist, astronaut, team leader of the Excalibur crew. He was joined on this LexCorp space mission by his wife and two others. Now they hit some cosmic radiation and in turn their shuttle crashed. Two of the passengers' bodies turned into cosmic radiation, then the other turned into a gravel spaceship part anomaly, which I gotta say, one gets cosmic powers, the other turns into a bunk bed, Ben Grimm. That's not fair at all. Hank's wife, Terry, was one of the four hit with the cosmic radiation, but she seemed fine afterwards for, for a little bit, that's important. Hank's hair also only turned white, so they were both lucky, all things considered. The crew then went to Metropolis to use the LexCorp facilities and hopefully fix their friend and crewmate's cosmic problem. The team ended up clashing with Superman. They were all decaying rapidly. Everybody's scared, so of course they're gonna freak out a little bit. Steven flew into the sun. He felt attracted to its powers and then flew into his own death like a moth. All that cosmic stuff. He was like, mm, and then he just disappeared. Hank manages to tip Superman off right before he decays, so they were only able to save Terry. Jim didn't want to live as a space shuttle rock cluster anymore, so he walked into a MRI scanner, just ended his own life. Really tragic stuff. Terry was now the only survivor of this cosmic nightmare, but in Adventures of Superman issue 468, it was revealed Hank lived through iCloud. Basically, he transferred his consciousness to LexCorp's mainframe and then he took over NASA's equipment and beamed his mind into the birthing matrix, the pod that carried Superman from Krypton to Earth. So now he was able to travel the cosmos and just learn about local life forms and their history. He eventually came to the conclusion that Superman was in fact evil and he needed to be stopped. After Superman died battling Doomsday, Hank claimed to be Superman Reborn, and of course, people bought it, because look at him. This is why you back your phone up, people, in case you become an astronaut and your best friend turns into a ball of space junk. You don't want that happening. And finally, number one, Mr. Mixelplick. This man of mystery made his first dazzling appearance in Superman Volume 2, Issue 11. At first sight, he seems like an ordinary man with an excellent beard and jawline. He's in the office with Lois and Clark, he's the new guy, and right as Lois and Clark are about to leave and go for their lunch date, this random 
random dude starts to rub Lois's feet. Normal office behavior, sure. And then even weirder, Lois bails on Clark. Now she wants to go to lunch with Foot Rub Ronnie. So they go to lunch and they come back four hours later and at this point Lois still doesn't know anything about this man somehow. She's oblivious also to a grill attack that's taking place behind her. So she's in a daze, something is afoot. And then he turns Lois into a mannequin. So what's happening right now? What, who is this guy? This man is in fact not a hunk, he's actually an imp from the fifth dimension. Close enough. His real name doesn't even translate into Earth's languages but we collectively pronounce it as Mr. Mixelplick. He can manipulate anything and everything. He's nigh omnipotent and he's into feet. I think this guy is way too much for the DCEU in any way. Kicking off the list at number 10, The Time Trapper. First appearing in Adventure Comics 317, The Time Trapper comes from the far future. He actually prevented the legion of superheroes from traveling into their future using an iron curtain of time. He likes to hang out at his home located safely at the end of time. How neat is that? Kind of similar to Kang. In his first few issues, The Time Trapper was seeking the Concentrator, which is a weapon that draws energy, any energy source in the known universe, together. It's also a pretty big secret as well. The Time Trapper pretended to be the commissioner of the science police and tortured the Legionnaires, although they said it was a test in order to gain intel. Now Lightning Lad knew something was fishy so he cracked and spilled secrets, false ones of course. So this brought the team to actually figure out how to assemble the real Concentrator. And when an angry Time Trapper returned, he launched a plethora of Dark Stars at the crew, but luckily that Concentrator could absorb any energy source like I said, so they were blasted out of existence. We're good. The Legion lived to tell the tail, but we just got Kang in the MCU, so I don't think we need another Time Lord showing up. My brain hurts enough already. Give us like five years and then bring in some more time stuff. Number nine, Eclipso. Making his first appearance in House of Secrets issue 61, Eclipso was made from God's spirit of wrath. He's the living embodiment of wrath. It doesn't get more menacing than that, folks. He was made to punish the wicked, to clean the world of evil, of course, until the specter replaced him. Wrath was driven by anger, whereas vengeance, that required more of a discerning hand. So what happened after was wrath's physicality was trapped within an all-black diamond called the Heart of Darkness. The Heart of Darkness, kind of like the Heart of the Ocean, but instead of Rose tossing it overboard, a treasure hunter found it in Africa and accidentally split it into a thousand pieces. And now we're all each of those pieces contained a shard of darkness. So Eclipso figured out a way to possess people through these diamonds, and that first man being possessed was Bruce Gordon. Bruce was a scientist specializing in solar energy. While he was in a jungle observing a solar eclipse, a sorcerer named Mofir attacked him with one of those black diamonds, and after that, every eclipse, Eclipso would take over Bruce. Unbeknownst to Bruce though, Eclipso would soon learn to bind himself to anybody near any shard that happened to be angry at the time. Nowadays, there's a lot of angry folks, so this is bad news. The Entity of wrath possessing anybody who gets upset, that sounds, yeah, just smile and wave, I guess. Just lie. Just lie and pretend you're happy. Then you're good. Before we continue on with this list, if you want to spread the love and hit that thumbs up, it really does wonders for us at the channel. You guys are amazing. Thanks so much for watching. Let's keep, let's keep this going. Number eight, Justice Lord Superman. Coming from the animated universe, the 2003 Justice League episode titled A Better World showed us one that's rather the opposite. This parallel universe showed Kal-El and the Justice Lords storming the White House after President Lex Luthor had just executed the Flash. Now the team of course wasn't too happy, so Batman and Wonder Woman fought off the Secret Service while Superman told Luthor that he's taken him in. Lex is insane, so we had a button ready that could literally start a nuclear war if it was pressed. And he's threatening Superman Superman, saying that he needs to use deadly force if he wants to save the people. So Superman's like, okay, and then just eyes glow red, and then he turns them into ashes, just like that. And when Batman and Wonder Woman come back in, it's, well, it's far too late. Superman just has a smile on his face, and Lex is just a pile of dust. Good times. After this, for the next two years, the Justice Lords would rule using violence like it was normal. They saw this and they're like, well, that certainly did the trick. Let's just keep doing that. Justice Lord Superman used his heat vision to wipe out all of Earth's criminals and villains. If we had him in the DCEU, the movie would be a lot shorter than four hours. It would be like 36 minutes. Snatter cut, maybe 44 minutes. Number seven, Superboy Prime, another super menace. First appearing in DC Comics Presents issue 87, this version of Supes has more powers and less weaknesses. I'm talking immunity to kryptonite and magic, which is a 
fantastic combo. He arrived to Earth and was soon discovered by Jerry and Naomi Kent while they were on a hike in a New England seacoast town. They named him Clark, although Clark Kent was the name of a popular comic book hero named Superman. So yeah, Superman already existed on this Earth, so Clark grew up and later attended a costume party at a beach and dressed like Superman. He went to get a glimpse of Haley's Comet and it was all a good time, and then all of a sudden a tidal wave hits, this portal opens up, and the Superman from the comics pops out. Now at the same time, young Clark's powers manifested and he quickly learned what to do with them in the moment. Superboy then followed that Superman back into the portal to an alternate reality and he would never be the same again. Crisis on Infinite Earths was this multiversal catastrophe where parallel dimensions were being consumed by the Anti-Monitor who I'll talk about later. Superboy dove in, joined the fight, but was unable to prevent the destruction of his Earth. So Superboy Prime and other survivors escaped to a paradise dimension that Alexander Luther Jr. offered. Using crystals, Superboy just relived happy times in this paradise, but eventually he got frustrated and shattered the barrier of reality. He literally punched everything apart. He retconned quite a bit in DC continuity. For example, he brought back Jason Todd, he combined Superman's origins, Doom Patrol was now rebooted, and we had numerous incarnations of Hawk Man and the League of Superheroes. I feel like DC could use a big bad Superboy Prime Punch to clear up the timeline, but hopefully the Flash movie does that, because this guy is just a little, a little too crazy. Number six, Brainiac. Another close rival of Superman's, Brainiac made his first appearance in Action Comics 242. This guy right off the bat is a very specific villain. He would love to steal cities. Yeah, watch out for your cities, keep them safe, put them under your mattress. He took Metropolis at one point, this guy's wild. He would use his shrinking ray, zoom, shrink your city, and then take them back to his planet. Vril Doc started his days as a scientist, and one day he successfully cloned himself because he needed an assistant, so who better to hire than yourself? He built the spaceship next and traveled to the cosmos, gaining knowledge and studying alien organisms with the help of his robot drones. And during these travels, he came across Krypton while General Zod was still running the show. So of course, this dude shrunk down the entire city of Kandor and studied it in his ship. He made a remote scout unit that believed it was the original real docks, and then it traveled to Earth and took over the body of sideshow mentalist Milton Fine, whose stage name was Brainiac. Now it makes sense. Number five, Necron. Also known as the Lord of the Unliving, great. Necron made his first appearance in Tales of the Green Lantern Corps, issue two. He's literally the embodiment of death. Necron figured out the land of the living existed after the death of an immortal caused a rift to open between dimensions. So Necron saw all this life and he was like, mm, this looks tasty. He wanted it. Well, really he wanted to master it and get out of his hell, his literal hell that he was living in. So he resurrected Krona, even throwing in a classy army of the dead to assist in taking down the guardians of the universe. Taking them down ended up widening the rift, so it took all the Green Lantern Corps to stop them, but even after winning, countless lives were lost in this fight. Hal Jordan ended up going to the land of the unliving, accepting the possibility that he may just never return, and there he gathered the souls of other fallen lanterns, and it was just enough to fight off Necron and return, with the Guardian sealing the rift promptly afterwards. But like Necron says, you can never defeat death. Back in 2009, it was revealed Necron was behind the Black Lanterns and instigated the Blackest Night event. There he took over the bodies of Wonder Woman and Superman while also bringing back dead heroes to join his side. Number four, Prometheus. Helmets are pretty important, especially in combat. And especially if one helmet in particular gave you the skills to beat, I don't know, Batman? Prometheus first appeared in New Year's Evil, Prometheus issue one back in the late 90s. And at first he was just the son of two criminals who traveled across the US, real Bonnie and Clyde style. But as a kid, he would have to go with them, right? Because they couldn't afford a babysitter. They were rich with like mob money, but they couldn't afford a babysitter. Okay, so eventually the police caught on and they were never seen again. The police killed them in front of the boy, almost like a darker Bruce Wayne origin. So he grew up with their fortune, only it was a stolen fortune. Then he traveled the world, trained as a fighter, trained as a mercenary. He learned a dozen different languages and he was pretty skilled by the end of it. Then he found the ancient city of Shambhala where their monks studied evil. They trusted him and showed him their greatest treasure, which was an alien ship. Not too bad. Their leader was actually an alien in disguise. He landed there, but Prometheus had to kill him to obtain the key to enter the ghost zone. The ghost zone was his infinite expanse of white emptiness, the space between dimensions. Kryptonians called this the Phantom Zone. And in there, Prometheus built himself a house, a costume, and his first advanced helmet that downloads info to take on the Justice League. He was great. Like He shot Martian Manhunter so then he couldn't change he infected Steel's armor with a virus, he hypnotized Huntress, and he hit Green Lantern with a neural shaft so his ring was useless. He also trapped Zuriel in said ghost zone and beat Batman with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Not too shabby at all. 
Number three, the Batman who laughs. We've seen quite a few Batman on screen. We're even seeing Michael Keaton return to Gotham in the next Flash movie, which is pretty exciting. But the Batman who laughs, AKA the Darkest Knight, might be a bit too hardcore for the theaters. Coming from the Dark Multiverse, first appearing in Dark Days, the casting, created by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, comes a twisted Earth-22 version of the Batman, the Batman who laughs. The Joker here is insane. He goes on the spree throughout Gotham, just chaos in the streets. He took out Jim Gordon, then he poisoned Batman, was all bad, and then once Batman was able to move again after the poison had run its course, he broke the Joker's neck, which is already immediately so dark. But even the Joker was prepared after death. After that snap, he let out this toxic breath that let everybody near him get infected, including Batman. Cut to two days later, Batman and Superman are talking about what happened, and when Superman tells Bruce that a kid infected by Joker bit a doctor, Bruce ends up laughing, like this maniacal laugh. And he catches himself after, he's like, <clears throat> sorry about that. Superman knows something's off here, but a day later, Bruce called the team to the Batcave and went full on Omni-Man. He took out the entire team before anybody caught on to his new and violent personality. Number two, the Anti-Monitor. Making his first appearance in Crisis on Infinite Earths issue two, the Anti-Monitor was DC's excuse to cut out a lot of fat from the comics, basically. The multiverse was introduced back in the 60s. The Golden Age heroes were residing on Earth 2, and then came Earth 3, and then so on and Danforth. So when Crisis on Infinite Earths came around, DC Comics introduced this big bad cosmic villain to set something straight going forward. Clean up the multiple timelines, makes sense. Now it all started when Krona performed this experiment. They wanted to see the origin of the universe, but instead an opposite universe was created, the Antimatter universe. Antimonitor wanted nothing but death and destruction, and after battling his brother for say I don't know a billion years they both fell unconscious and then nine billion years later they were woken up when they tried to destroy earth one many heroes lost their lives and in order to stop that chaos Superman had to punch them into a star who knows with the flash opening up the multiversal door we could see him on the big screen in our lifetime maybe maybe and finally, number one, Perpetua. Of course, one of the most feared beings in the greater Omniverse. Also known as the first creator, she made her first appearance in Justice League Volume 4, Issue 8. She was the mother of the Monitor, Anti-Monitor, and World Folder. She was actually one of the hands that created the multiverse, literally. Each member were these celestial beings and they would pass on and their energy would return to the source, but Perpetua was different. She wanted a dark, vicious reality that would live forever. So she created the first iteration of the multiverse using negative crisis energy energies and then had three cosmic children. She was creating an army also to rule over the multiverse, so her children snitched. Yeah, they told the judges of the source and Perpetua was locked away outside the source wall with her negative energies. But even locked away, she was able to connect to Lex Luthor, who believed freeing her would make him a hero on some multiversal scale. So next time you want to kick somebody out of your party, just banish them to the source wall with their negative energy. That's how he works. Kicking off the list at number 10, Mr. Sinister. Dr. Nathaniel Essex made his first debut in Uncanny X-Men 221. Now it's not that easy to forget once you take a glimpse at him, cause he's kind of terrifying in every way. He's also obsessed with experimenting on mutants, and yes, that includes himself. He was obsessed with Darwin's theory of evolution, but he felt like they were shackled by too many moral constraints. That's, that, doesn't that sound lovely? <laughs> it's off the bat. He couldn't get funding from the Hellfire Club, so he got together a group that he named the Marauders, and then he got them to kidnap people off the streets of London so he can then experiment on them. So dark already, the guy is twisted. He even tried to experiment on his son, who was no longer alive. This guy may be a little bit too twisted for the MCU, you, but he does bring back dead characters, so maybe he's a blessing in disguise. Number nine, Blastar. Making his first appearance in Fantastic Four issue 62, Blastar once was the ruler of Balur, a planet in the negative zone. The inhabitants of said planet were not a fan of this horrible ruling, so they voted him off the island. They revolted and sent him adrift into the cosmos. Now during that field trip in space, he bumped into Mr. Fantastic, who at that point was already on his way back to Earth with the inhuman Triton. So Blastar followed them through the portal teamed up with Sandman and fought the Fantastic Four. He ended up losing this battle and was sent back to his own dimension, which sounds like a win, but this was only the beginning. He then became king once again, but this time he expanded his territory. It also helped that this time around he stole Annihilus' cosmic control rod. This guy is pretty hardcore, and at one point in the comics, he tried to collect all the Infinity Stones before Thanos. Somebody tell Blastar he's a little bit too late for the MCU. And before we continue on with this list, you know the drill. If you're loving the content, or if you want a part three, or if you're just liking the curls so far, give us a thumbs up. It really helps us out quite a bit, and then in turn, we can give you back as much as we can. You're the best, thank you so much. Right back to this list. Number eight, Shadow King. Making his first appearance in X-Men 117, the Shadow King is a multiversal manifestation of the dark side of 
of the human consciousness spawned by the first nightmare. Doesn't that sound nice already? Sick. Amal Farouk was the leader of the underground syndicate located in the Thieves' Quarter in Cairo, Egypt. He's a powerful mutant who also happens to be a vessel for said Shadow King. Farouk was able to control everybody around him. It's pretty terrifying. He feeds on the shadows of your soul. So yeah, with Marvel veering off into the cosmic side of things, maybe we can see a Shadow King whenever the X-Men come into the picture. Now in the comics, before World War II, Amal Farouk worked with Baron Von Strucker to try and destabilize Britain's political structure. So maybe he's been there the whole time. I kind of hope he's not though, because he's terrifying. Number seven, the fallen one. First appearing in Thanos issue 11, the fallen one was once a herald of Galactus, who of course we mentioned in part one. Now the difference between later heralds of Galactus, this fallen one was empowered by dark energy instead of cosmic radiation, which was the norm. So in turn, he was quite cruel. He was evil enough that Galactus himself had to imprison him. The fallen one was also a sneaky one. He would often escape and then reattack Galactus all over again. It was a vicious circle until Star-Lord came in and imprisoned the fallen one into the Klin, that prison we see in the garden of the galaxy. Now, when the Klin was later destroyed during a conflict with Thanos and the Maker, the Fallen One again broke free, went back to Galactus, but this time Galactus teleported him back to Thanos. He's like, no, 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 you go fight him, Mr. Crazy Guy, get out of here. Thanos ended up defeating him, but only because he tricked the Fallen One into igniting a gas giant. At this point, Thanos made him become a herald for himself, right? Might as well. The Fallen One can control black matter, which is a pretty big deal. He can use that matter to enhance his own speed, strength, durability, you name it. You wouldn't see him coming either because he can travel at the same speed of light. Now we just got Thanos out of the MCU, so let's never bring back his Herald either. No thanks. Number six, Spiral. Rita Wayward made her debut in Longshot issue one. She's actually a loyal servant to the spineless mojo that we mentioned in part one of this list. But it didn't always start that way, of course not. See, Ricochet Rita was once a professional stunt performer. She became friends with a guy named Longshot who was already from that mojo verse. She was actually attacked by this insane version of her Herself called Spiral from the future. They fought, she won, and she thought that was the end of that problem. Now you gotta remember that because it's for sure not the end. Rita actually decided to follow her heart and go back to that Mojo verse with her new boy toy, Longshot. And then when they get there, they're both captured by Mojo. Longshot's mind was wiped, now forgetting Rita, which is so sad already. But for Rita, it just gets worse. Mojo got his scientists to modify her mentally and physically, so now she has six arms, and her hair is also gray, and now, oh, she could also see other dimensions. She was like a twisted little version of Mojo, and she got trained in the dark arts of magic and body modification. And as you may have guessed, that future version of her was just that. Mojo sent her new and improved self to go back in time and attack her past self. It's just a nice loop of trouble. Number five, Kid Omega. Quentin Choir made his first appearance in X-Men issue 134. He's been described as one of the most powerful telepaths right next to Jean Grey. And believe it or not, he was once also the host of the Phoenix Force. In his early super days, Quentin was one of Xavier's prized pupils, you know, until he put together the Omega Gang. He wasn't always a bad kid though. It's just on his birthday when he was still young, he received a call from his parents to say that he was adopted. And honestly, if I got that gift on my birthday, I'd probably turn evil too. I don't blame the kid. This Omega gang likes to handle humans the way that they feel like, you know, with violence and mutant monologues. He's been described as an Omega level telepath and telekinetic. So if mutants are too much for the MCU right now, Kid Omega surely won't be around for quite a while. Number four, Overmind. First appearing in Fantastic Four issue 113, Overmind, AKA Grom, was an eternal born on the planet Young. He was a fierce gladiator whose job it was to prevent overpopulation. He conquered hundreds of worlds, he won thousands of fights, and he took out entire species. He's the champion of champions. Literally, the Eternals held the games to test everybody to see who the most powerful was, and Grom was the winner. He's the ultimate physical specimen of the Eternals, and part of me wants to meet him in the next Eternals movie, and part of me doesn't want to know what conquering planets and thousands of souls looks like either. Let's keep this guy in the books, definitely. Number three, Juggernaut. Kane Marco made his first comic book appearance in X-Men issue 12. When Kane and Charles Xavier were serving together in the same unit, they were all under fire, so they had to run and take cover in a nearby cave. Now the cave was actually home to the lost temple of Sidorak. So just who is the Sidorak guy? And also, nice temple by the way. Sidorak is a powerful entity that is both a god and a demon. Best of both worlds, lovely. He was worshipped on Earth way back in the day, but was eventually banished to the 
Crimson Cosmos. Sidorak's gem contained all of its power, so when Kane stumbled across it and then decided to read the inscription, whoever touches this gem shall possess the power of the Crimson Bands of Sidorak. Henceforth, you who read these words shall become forevermore a human juggernaut. And then Kane turned into just that. Now we have Ryan Reynolds coming over from the Foxverse into the MCU, and I doubt they would bring over such a high caliber character like Juggernaut as well. He might be a little bit too soon for that. He would literally rip the Avengers apart also. We see Doctor Strange summon the Crimson Bands of Sidorak in Infinity War while the team is fighting Thanos on Titan. So never say never. Number two, Proteus. Kevin McTaggart was the son of Moira McTaggart and her husband Joseph. Now the marriage was the opposite of healthy. Joseph was abusive mentally and physically and just an all around horrible human being. So Moira got out of there. She didn't even tell Joseph that she was pregnant. The less he knows the better, honestly. Just move on, get out of Dodge. So young Kevin and Moira soon lived together at her mutant research center off the coast of Scotland. Now Kevin, as he got older, manifested mutant abilities, so now he has this uncontrollable need for power. He craved it, literally. So Moira had to hide him. She had to keep him locked up in a cell for years and only referred to him as Mutant X, which is kind of a dark nickname already off the bat. I mean, sure, could have just still called him Kevin, but great. She wanted to keep him safe and also not have strangers get the soul sucked out of them on their way to work, so that's a bonus. Keep him tucked below. But one day, while Magneto was fighting the X-Men, Kevin's cell was damaged and he got out. Since the isosteric energy in his cell was no longer holding him back, Kevin was able to take down Polaris, Multiple Man, and he was even able to evade the Phoenix. But after doing so, his body began to burn out, just like Moira tried to prevent all this time. So now the only solution he has was to possess human hosts, one after another. He renamed himself Proteus, with his imagination the only thing that limits his powers. He's made of psionic energy, and he too can warp reality. Every time he possesses a new host, he gets stronger and stronger and stronger, until until eventually the host burns out and then he warps to possess another poor soul. And finally, number one, Amora the Enchantress. She made her first debut back in Journey into Mystery issue 103 and her relationship with Thor is, Honestly, I'd kind of love to see this in live action, but I feel like we're quite far from this type of power in the MCU. So half the time she wants to take out Thor and the other half she's trying to take him out to dinner. It's really a love-hate relationship. Now, Amora has a pretty sweet life before all this. She's got multiple mansions throughout all the nine realms and can make gold and diamonds with her tears. So even on a bad day, she's still getting rich. She's really good at seducing people as well. I mean, it's literally her superpower. For example, Scourge, she would seduce him into helping her with evil plans, and he was like, oh yeah, you bet, anything for you. You're so hot, let's do it. And then afterwards, Amora wouldn't follow through with her side of the deal. She would just continue to play hard to get. She messes with your mind and your heart. That's a double whammy. One kiss is all it takes for her to completely own you and your soul. In the comics, she was sent by Odin to take out Jane Foster because the whole, you know, loving on different worlds thing is long distance, I guess. That's a no-go for the God Squad. But when she tried to attack Jane, Thor intervened and she was banished to Earth by Odin, where she then joined the Masters of Evil. Now, she doesn't have too much experience with hand-to-hand -hand combat because, well, she doesn't really need it. She just gets other lovers to fight her fights for her. The Bachelorette in Space. Nice. Tune in. Love it. Kicking off the list at number 10, Matthew Malloy. While we're eagerly awaiting the arrival of mutants into the MCU, there's quite a few mutants that I wouldn't want hanging out near Peter, Ned, or MJ. Like Matthew Malloy, for example. See, Matthew was a regular Joe living in Charleston, South Carolina, but all of a sudden Earth gets hit with a scroll invasion. Gotta love Mondays in the Marvel Universe. Sick. Things escalate when his wife Jules is vaporized by a blast from said scroll ship and his home was also just toast. Just a complete tragedy from the start. Now one depressing dark lonely year later he sees his late wife's sister and they finally catch up. And it's hard for Matthew of course to talk about this stuff. This is still just a year ago so it's all very fresh. So he's feeling it and that's when his mutant powers decided to manifest. He erupted with energy sadly also ending the life of Jules' sister. Not looking good so far. And then while he's standing there in shock, Maria Hill's hologram shows up out of a drone and she's like, are you okay? Are you a mutant? What are your powers? What's going on? Do you have Geico? He's a little stressed out on what's happening, so he freaks out a little more. So she sends in a strike team, and this just caused him to release even more energy and take even more lives. S.H.I.E.L.D. ended up sending in an airstrike, and that ended the lives of Cyclops, Magic, and Matthew, but those powers were better than we thought, because Matthew came back to life. Immortality for the win. Next, he teleported to the Jean Grey school, where he then took the life of Emma Frost. Now, Tempest, at this point, decided the only way to take care of this beyond Omega level threat was to go back in time and make sure his parents never meet. Then we can avoid having the supervillain from exploding over and over again. 
There's a link there, page 10. Mutants are cool and all, but this is evidence of how a regular guy can be riddled with tragedy in the Marvel Universe. Imagine if Zemo got these powers, Civil War would be over in like 22 minutes. Number nine, Molecule Man. Owen Reese started his days out as a small, puny, ridiculously looking laboratory technician whose life changed forever one day at work. Also, that's how the Watcher described him. I'm not being mean. He's breaking down his origins to the Fantastic Four, and he's low-key roasting the guy the entire time. It's pretty great. He was working for Act May Atomic Corp, but one day he got distracted and made a mistake while making adjustments to that atomic machine. He was distracted because he was monologuing about how much his life sucks. He was like, oh, I'm just a nobody wearing green pants at work. Boo hoo, no one knows my name. And then in the middle of his pity party, he gets blasted with energy, but somehow he survives. His boss of 12 years calls him in the office and he's like, hey, I heard about your accident, Mr. Eh, whatever your name is. We can't have that happen here. You're fired, which first of all, as far as lawsuits go, could you imagine? But Owen doesn't pack up and leave. No, instead, he pulls out a wand that can control his powers and he turns boss man into a snow cone. He can now control every molecule in the universe. And like Reed Richards says, if a man can control molecules, he can control anything. Guy's really brilliant with that groundbreaking assessment. Thanks, Reed. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, it's a lot of dark, tragic stuff going on here, so let's brighten the mood a little bit by doing a little hitting that button. Thanks so much, you guys are the best. Back to this list. Number eight, Mad Jim Jaspers. Old Jimmy J, okay, he made his first appearance in Daredevils number seven back in 1983. He was created by Alan Davis and Alan Moore, and when he first hit the pages, he was a British politician serving as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He was serving as a member of parliament for Haslam West, and he wasn't a fan of superheroes either. He wanted to keep Britain safe, and superheroes crashing through buildings and punching each other in the back. No thanks, sounds like the opposite of safety. They're old school, I get it. But he also wasn't alone. Many others agreed with him, and in turn, he won a general election. Only two issues after he's introduced, we find out he's a mutant with reality warping powers, who of course is also insane. He was just taking out other heroes so that he could rule secretly. Classic little twisty twist. He created and used this machine called the Fury, which hunted down superhumans. Meanwhile, he would be off committing crimes with his Alice in Wonderland themed gang. I know Disney loves crossovers, but I think this would be a little, little too weird. Number seven, Mephisto. In a list of villains too powerful for the MCU, clearly Mephisto is on that list. We thought he was gonna be the one pulling the strings in WandaVision, but as the catchy theme song revealed, it was Agatha Harkness all along. Mephisto made his first full appearance in Silver Surfer issue three. And he's been making deals with everybody since. Like when Spider-Man revealed his identity in the Civil War storyline, that led to a bullet striking Aunt May. So he offers Peter a deal while Aunt May is dying in the hospital. The world will forget Peter Parker is truly Spider-Man, but in turn, Mephisto gets his marriage. It's kind of like Shrek 4, but way more fun. And this movie's probably gonna make way more money than Shrek 4. I mean, maybe, hopefully, I hope. You don't even need to be a superhero to have an eventful night with Mephisto either. Like in Journey into Mystery issue 627, he would show up to a random pub and he tells the bartender a story and if you listen to his tale, he'll give you a nice fat tip. But if you slip up, things can get pretty ugly. Next time you get that really annoying regular at your bar, just think it could literally be the devil and be a lot worse. Consider yourself lucky. Number six, Vulcan. The younger brother of both Cyclops and Havoc, Gabriel Summers made his first appearance in X-Men Deadly Genesis before Catherine Summers even even had a chance to give birth to the third child, he was transferred into an incubation accelerator, so he grew up real quick. After this, he was sent to Earth to work for Eric the Red, but luckily, he didn't stick around to let that happen too long. He changed his name quickly from Gabriel to Kid Vulcan, which sounds way cooler already, but it was also inspired by Roman mythology. I guess the other names already belong to DC characters. But Xavier eventually met him, and because of his mental powers, he knew that this boy was a relative to the Summers family. Vulcan had forgotten about his history at this point as well, but he suited up with Petra, Darwin, and Sway, and together they rescued the original X-Men. It wasn't easy though. Cyclops thought Vulcan had died when the island decided to fight back. Vulcan is an Omega level mutant, and he's also insane. What a, what a jazzy combo. Vulcan can manipulate, absorb, and control energy. This includes Cyclops optic blasts, or even Adam Warlock's energy. And of course, interstellar flight makes those cosmic commutes nice and smooth. Number five, Onslaught. Making his first debut in X-Men issue 15, Onslaught was a sentient psionic entity created from the minds of Charles Xavier and Magneto. 
So when the X-Men were fighting the Acolytes, Wolverine hit Magneto, and then in turn, Magneto ripped the adamantium from his bones, which I've mentioned on other lists before, because that's one of the more painful encounters I've ever seen in comic books. His healing factor then had to work overtime, and Xavier at this point decided it would be the right move to just shut Magneto's mind down. So then he made him catatonic. But during this exact moment, all of Magneto's lust for hate and violence leaked into Charles' subconscious, creating this new personality, Onslaught. Onslaught is quite lucky, because now he gets to tap into the psychic resources of the astral plane where he can manipulate matter and energy. I mean, let's get X-Men into the MCU first, and then we'll start talking about evil mashups and swaps. Number four, Mojo. Making his first debut in Longshot issue three, Mojo is known for using Earth as forms of TV entertainment for the universe. Just like the team over here at Top 10 Nerd, the more views he gets for this interdimensional TV show, the more powerful he gets as well. So if you didn't hit that like button, now you really have to. So in the 1992 issue titled Mojo's Media Madness, he had this wild storyline where Mojo gets Rogue, Cyclops, Beast, and Wolverine, and they all think that they're characters from The Wizard of Oz. It sounds fun, but for the MCU, this would be way too stupid, dare I say. The comic is crazy enough. I mean, we see his madness really unfold in X-Men issue 10. Mojo is a unique villain. He's part of a race called the Spineless Beings, and they're from a planet named after him called Mojo World inside of a pocket dimension called Mojoverse. It's just all about him, eh? Well. Wow. So this race of spineless beings were also slowly going crazy over time because TV signals from other space-time continuums like ours were scattered into their timelines. He's a powerful sorcerer, and we're not exactly sure just how far his magic can go. We'll stick to watching these guys on our TV rather than having them sucked into an interdimensional Netflix, you know? That sounds better. Number three, Apocalypse. Making his first steps in Marvel graphic novel issue 17, and then making his first full appearance in X-Factor issue five, Apocalypse was born nearly 5,000 years ago at the edge of the Valley of the Kings in ancient Egypt. He was abandoned by his tribe because of the fact that he looked different. He had the blue man group avatar vibe going on, so they left the child. How mean. Later on, he was raised by the nomads with the idea that only the strong survive. So already such a tragic childhood. Now in the desert, along came Ball of the Crimson Sands, leader of the Sandstormers, and he saw this kid crying and he also saw potential, because clearly he was different. So he named him Aunt Sabinor, which translates to Morning Light. He grew up becoming the most feared in the land and eventually Baal led him to Ramatut's time ship in an underground tomb. Now, Ball didn't survive this cave expedition, but Nur was now determined to be anything but an abused worker. Now he wanted revenge on Ramatut, the pharaoh ruler. And after being thrown into a pit of snakes, Nur grew in size and strength, easily defeating all the guards before finally declaring himself Apocalypse. We had this guy already in the Fox first, but it didn't feel too great. I think we should let that wound heal a bit before bringing him into the MCU with the X-Men. Maybe like eight years, then we'll talk. Number two, Modoc. Making its first appearance in Tales of Suspense issue 93, MODOK was created by Dr. George Tarleton. He had worked with the team recently to create the Cosmic Cube, but the scientist supreme, Lyle Getz, figured the next logical step was figuring out a way to understand the powers inside said cube. We see this happen a little bit in the MCU. So enter Project MODOK, yes, spelled with a C at the end instead of a K. That's important, you gotta remember that. MODOK stood for Mental Organism Designed Only for Computing. It sounds like a high-tech series, sounds perfect. What a great way to analyze and probe this cosmic cube. So they grabbed that scientist George that I mentioned and altered him into this big-headed supercomputer. That's when things start to go south, obviously. With a brain too big for his body, they had to give him a hover chair, which is referred to as the doomsday chair. Already, it's this downhill. The scientist did not know that with great power comes great responsibility, so it wasn't long before Modoc overtook his masters, changed that last letter from a C to a K, making his new, more suitable name for the list, Modoc, mental organism designed only for killing. He's the big bad in the new Avengers game that's not too good, but it's still worth a play. And yes, he's as crazy as it sounds. And finally, number one, Galactus. Wielder of the power cosmic. This one has to eat planets in order to survive. Yummy. We saw him in Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer. Well, I mean, we saw a cloud that sort of looked like him, I guess. Galactus, the devourer of worlds. Let's talk about him. The Great Destroyer made his first appearance in Fantastic Four issue 48. He's the sole survivor of the sixth incarnation of the multiverse. He's the sole survivor of the sixth incarnation of the multiverse. But originally, he was a humanoid named Galan, born on a previous version of Earth called Planet Ta. It was a paradise whose civilization was much more advanced than any other in the universe 
first at the time, which sounds quite lovely. But when the cosmos were soon ending the embodiment of the sixth infinity, the sentience of the multiverse approached Galan and merged with him. So now Galactus resides in the seventh iteration of his universe, which is home to our Earth 616. He's extremely powerful. He once ate all the infinity stones, so maybe we'll just keep them hidden in Casey's office desk for now, just to be safe. Guys, there you have it. Those are 10 villains too powerful for the MCU, but never say never. Number 10, the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a figure from indigenous folklore who was first adapted to Marvel Comics in Incredible Hulk number 162. The curse of the Wendigo is something that happens when a person engages in cannibalism in the Canadian wilderness. The curse causes the person to transform into a vicious creature who has an insatiable hunger for human flesh. In its first comic appearance, the Wendigo was a man named Paul Cartier who went on a hunting trip with his friends Georges Baptiste and Henri Clouseau. When they were attacked by wolves, the trio were forced to hide in a cave where Henri died. After four days trapped in the cave with no supplies, Georges wakes up and finds Paul eating his friend's remains, inadvertently giving himself the Wendigo curse. The Wendigo is a mindless creature who never stops being hungry, no matter how many people he eats. So, as a result, he will go all out with all of his attacks and will do anything in its power to get its next meal. There have been several different Wendigo over the years, and they have been difficult foes to defeat for the Hulk, Wolverine, the X-Men, and Alpha Flight due to their strength, their savagery, and their powerful healing factors. Number 9. Doomsday. In the ancient Kryptonian days, a scientist wanted to create the ultimate life form. He accomplished this by sending a baby onto the planet's surface and waiting for either the elements or the creatures on the planet to, well, let's say, help the baby buy the farm. He would then take whatever remains were left and clone the baby to create a stronger clone baby, effectively forcing evolution to create the most brutal and effective creature possible. After decades of this bizarre our process, Doomsday was born. Doomsday is nearly impossible to defeat, being essentially invulnerable and super strong. And if you do manage to hurt him, he has a powerful healing factor that will almost immediately undo the damage. If you manage to kill him, he not only comes back to life, but will be evolved to resist damage from whatever hurt him before. He is an unstoppable force that only gets better at fighting you each time. Like the Wendigo, he is an almost completely mindless creature with no goal other than to destroy all all living things around him. When he first came to Earth, he was able to tear through the entire Justice League with them barely slowing him down, and the only person on Earth capable of standing up to him was Superman. Superman was eventually able to kill Doomsday, but it took him having to not hold back at all, and even then, the effort resulted in both Doomsday and the Man of Steel dying in the process. Because he is so mindless and therefore isn't even aware of the fact that he's not holding back, I've put him and the Wendigo at the bottom of this list. List. Number 8. Kingpin After being bullied for his weight as a young child by school bullies, Wilson Fisk decided to become the best at whatever he put his mind to, becoming a bodybuilder and training in various martial arts to become a fearsome and effective fighter. Besides this, he also realized the importance of intelligence, but being from a poor family, had to teach himself using books he would borrow or steal from the library. He was an expert at organizing his fellow criminals and by the age of 15 was the head of the gang and was known as the Kingpin of Crime. His criminal empire grew as he worked his way up the ranks of organized crime in New York, eventually being in control of the entire criminal operation as well as several legitimate businesses. In order to maintain his control, he is willing to cause the deaths of countless men, women, and children, once even unleashing a helicopter attack and using a crazed super soldier known as Nuke to attack the people of Hell's Kitchen just to try and draw out Daredevil. The closest thing Fisk has shown to mercy in a long time was when he agreed to take care of the man's daughter before killing him. The daughter grew up to be Echo, who later shot Fisk in the head, so there's karma at work for you, I guess. Number 7. The Abomination Emil Blonsky was a communist spy who was working undercover at the same military base as Bruce Banner, working to sabotage the Gamma experiments so that the US forces would not become more advanced than the communists. When a distraught Bruce Banner tried to take his own life with a Gamma machine in his lab, Blonsky was there spying on the professor. When Bruce's self-harm attempt was interrupted and he was taken away, Blonsky was hit by the gamma radiation instead. Like Banner, Blonsky had a strange genetic variation that caused 
caused the Gamma Rays to transform him into a creature, the Abomination, a merciless and murderous monster. Abomination is able to retain his human intelligence and is actually stronger than the Hulk, unless the Hulk reaches a state of total enragement. Unlike Banner, Abomination is thrilled with his new form and regularly goes on rampages, killing entire towns. He considers Hulk his equal, as both are disfigured and alone, but when he learned that Bruce had married his longtime sweetheart Betty Ross, he was enraged at the idea that the Hulk was happier than him, and in a move of sociopathic pettiness, when Betty was hospitalized, Blonsky injected his blood into her dialysis machine, killing her with gamma poisoning. Number 6. Bullseye Very little is known about the psychopathic assassin simply called Lester, better known as Bullseye. He has told contradictory stories about his childhood, with the only consistency being that he killed his father before using his incredible throwing skills to become a major league baseball player. However, he became bored of playing no-hitter games and instead became an operative of the United States NSA, before eventually becoming a freelance assassin. In Bullseye's hands, anything is a weapon, as he is able to throw both weapons and simple everyday objects with lethal and pinpoint accuracy. Despite the fact that he kills for money, he gets great satisfaction from his work and would still be a ruthless killer even if he were doing it for free. He's the evil poster boy for the phrase, do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. He has come into conflict with Daredevil several times over the years and never holds back from taking all he can from the man without fear, having fridged two of Matt's love interests over the years, Elektra and Karen Page, and having tried to go after others in a deranged desire to get a complete set. Even once he was paralyzed by Daredevil, he continued to try and ruin Matt's life, spending all his time locked in an iron lung, plotting and sending out minions to try and destroy Daredevil. Number 5. Sabretooth Victor Creed was born in the late 1800s in Canada when his mutation manifested. Like Wolverine, he has a powerful healing factor, an animalistic rage, claws, and heightened senses. His father kept him locked up in the cellar after he accidentally ended his brother's life over a slice of pie. Victor eventually escaped, going on a brutal rampage across Canada before eventually becoming a full-time supervillain, working as an assassin, joining the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, the Hellfire Club, and becoming leader of the Hand for a time. And that's just to name a few of the teams he's been a member of over his long life. Whereas Wolverine puts a great deal of effort into not giving in to his animal instinct, Sabretooth revels in it, taking great joy out of acting on every cruel and murderous thought that crosses his mind. He has joined a few hero teams over the years when it has served his interests, and he sometimes does seem to genuinely care for people, but all that is overshadowed by his desire to cause as much pain and suffering as he can. Number 4. Victor Zaz One of Batman's most twisted and disturbing enemies, Victor Zaz was a wealthy man whose parents died in a car accident. This sent him into a depression and he gambled away his family's fortune. He went to jump off a bridge, but was stopped by a homeless man who tried to rob him with a knife. Zaz killed the homeless man and liked it so much that he decided to spend the rest of his life liberating people from what he considers a pointless existence. For every victim he dispatches, Zaz marks himself with a scar, making his body his canvas. And as you can see, he has worked up quite the body count in the years he has been operating in Gotham City. Zaz doesn't think of his victims as people, rather as mindless zombies, and he believes that ending their lives is a mercy, so for that reason, he never holds back from earning new marks on his flesh. Number 3. Carnage Cletus Cassidy was a troubled young boy who took out his homicidal urges on his grandmother, his family dog, his school bullies, just anyone. By the time he was a grown-up, he had become a notorious serial murderer known for eating his victims. He adopted a personal philosophy that even the average person can commit murder if only he has the courage. If this was the end of his story, he'd be just as deserving of a slot as Zaz, but it is actually just the beginning. Cletus was eventually caught and sent to Rikers Island to serve 11 consecutive life sentences, where he was made the cellmate of Eddie Brock, aka Venom. The two did not get along, but when the Venom symbiote arrived at the prison to rescue Brock, it left behind a spawn. The new symbiote entered Cletus's bloodstream through a cut and bonded with him, transforming Forming him into the deadly Carnage. Carnage is even more powerful than Spider-Man and Venom combined, and as if that weren't bad enough, he still has Cletus's twisted life philosophy, which he tries to enact any chance he gets. He is a brutal and cruel killer who never holds back from ending another victim's life. Number 2. Darkseid 
A lot of you were wondering where Darkseid was on our Villains Who Hold backlist, saying we had forgotten him. On the contrary, we just think that Darkseid is one of the most brutal and merciless characters in comics and that he deserved to be saved for a list of villains who don't bother with mercy or holding back at all. After the old gods died in a battle against evil, the planets New Genesis and Apocalypse were born. The latter fell under the control of an evil and tyrannical new god called Darkseid. New Genesis housed the source of all life, the life equation, and Darkseid became obsessed with finding its opposite force, the anti-life equation. He discovered that the anti-life equation was on the planet Earth and began a campaign to conquer the planet, bringing him into constant conflict with the members of the Justice League, particularly Superman. He is all but immortal, invulnerable, and super strong, and as if that weren't bad enough, he is an incredible tactician with a keen scientific mind who has telepathic powers and the ability to shoot Omega Beams from his eyes, which he can use to either destroy or teleport his victims, such as when he sent Batman back to caveman times at the end of Final Crisis, essentially turning the Dark Knight into a temporal bomb. Even Superman has trouble going toe-to-toe -to -toe with this new god, whose only weakness is a substance called radium. Number 1. The Batman Who Laughs When the Joker of Earth-22 found out he was dying, he decided to go on one last spree in an attempt to send Batman over the edge. He killed all of the other supervillains in Gotham as well as Jim Gordon. He blew up several buildings and captured Batman. He forced the Dark Knight to watch as he killed the parents of kidnapped children in front of them before infecting them with Joker toxin in order to stop the madness, Batman broke free and broke the clown prince's neck. When he did this, Batman was inadvertently exposed to a Joker toxin, which corrupted his mind and gave him Joker's sick and twisted sense of humor and his murderous desires. This multiversal villain has all the cunning and skills of the Dark Knight mixed with all the cruelty of the Joker. This Batman went on to kill the Bat family as well as the entire Justice League before using his evil cunning to take over and destroy his world. He was then recruited to lead the group of evil Batmen in the evil cosmic being Barbados's plan to destroy the multiverse, but was defeated when the main universe's Batman did the one thing the Batman Who Laughs could not predict, and teamed up with the Joker to save the universe. He has stuck around since then, continuing to show how horrifying an evil Batman who never holds back really is. Scheming like a criminal ever since her debut is Lady Mastermind. She can create hyper-realistic telepathic illusions. One time in Extreme X-Men 9, she she created an illusion in Heather Cameron's head that Heather was stabbed, and Heather started bleeding through her pores in the real world. Her shirt was soaked with blood like there was a wound, but nothing was actually there. That's creepy. She also convinced Heather's dad that he was drowning and he suffocated in a room full of air. People tend to believe the illusions, even if it comes with major changes in the environment, it doesn't matter, they feel that real. Plus, with everything going on in the Marvel Universe, getting randomly teleported is not that surprising to think. Mastermind also can make illusions exactly your worst nightmare because she can read your mind a little. It's limited telepathy. She can use her limited telepathic powers to camouflage herself and others or make herself and others appear as someone else. In X-Men Volume 2 193, she does this and makes an X-Men unknowingly eliminate their teammate. Even if you knock her out, the illusions will sometimes stick around. Big brain doing big things. Next up, the Cajun sensation known as Gambit was one of my favorite X-Men characters when I was a kid. Remy LeBeau has the really cool mutant ability of molecular acceleration, allowing him to convert the potential energy of a non-living object through touch and kinetically excite the molecules to the point that they explode. Usually when a mutant has an ability that manipulates molecules, they have a pretty vast array of powers, but for Gambit, he mainly uses his abilities as simple attacks, charging up his cards or his bow staff. But in an alternate universe, there is a future variation of Gambit known as New Sun, who is what Gambit would be if he reached the full potential of his power. He can manipulate kinetic energy down to a molecular level, meaning New Sun can charge objects and living beings without being in contact with them. He can stop objects that are in motion and make still objects begin moving. He can turn into a wave of energy, letting him travel through space and other dimensions, and he was even able to defeat the Dark Phoenix in his own 
own universe. Now we do see 616 Gambit use a lot of the same abilities as New Sun in a fight between the two in Gambit's 1999 solo series, but we won't likely see him reach the full potential of his powers again anytime soon. In the wise words of Taylor Swift, Karma is a queen. Karma is also a telepath. She can read your thoughts and stuff, but her main ability is psychic possession. Karma overwhelms her victims' consciousness by sending them mental energy surges. It confuses their brain, and in that window, Karma slips into the driver's seat. She now controls your body like it were her own. She feels everything your body feels. You would enter a sort of like dreamlike state, and you wouldn't even remember anything after. Does she use this method for battling? Yes, but she could also really mess up your personal life if she wanted to. She can do this mind control thing with multiple people at once, but she has to switch from person to person. You can't pull an Uno reverse and mind control her. She has a psychic shield that she can throw up. I think what makes Karma extra powerful is that she could still win a fight without her mutant ability. She trained in self defense with many military specialists. She spent some time in Vietnam and learned about guns and first aid. And then when her sister died, she got her multi billion dollar company. She has mutant power, fire power, and financial power. She's doing good. John Paul Bobbier is an interesting mutant with a few different abilities. North Star's main ability is super speed. Now, not really in the traditional sense of running really fast, rather, North Star can propel his body at superhuman speed. Speeds, becoming a living projectile, channeling a portion of the kinetic energy of his body's molecules in a single direction. It's even possible for him to reach 99% the speed of light in a vacuum, but if he were to do that on Earth or something, he'd not only damage himself, but could quite possibly break the entire planet. He can also super speed any part of his body, basically giving him superhuman reflexes and an incredibly fast metabolism to heal wounds. What's really cool is that since he is taking atomic motion, from the molecules of his own muscles, they actually become closer and tighter, making him superhumanly durable as well, allowing him to survive moving at the speeds he does without tearing himself apart. He also uses his ability to fly by projecting the kinetic energy downwards, which in turn lifts him upwards. But in case that wasn't enough, North Star also has photokinesis, allowing him to generate a bright light, which, according to the wiki, is equivalent to half a million foot candles, which is an extremely weird frame of reference, but he can also release concussive blasts that do some pretty serious damage, so you know, you win some, you lose some. Our next mutant has powerful telepathic abilities again, and a god complex. His name is Game Master, and he has powerful telepathic abilities. So powerful, he actually needed cybernetic implants to help him control his power. What does he do with all this power? Well, he helped run a competition for mutants to fight each other to win a prize. Like a lot of power or something like that. Something tells me this guy would enjoy the Hunger Games trilogy and probably take notes while reading. He got to this point because he discovered that if he is able to really focus on a distraction like those games, then his mental load would be easier to carry. His mental load is a hefty one. He can hear the thoughts of every human on the planet, every living being. So maybe even animals, but that's also like 8 billion people. Their thoughts running through your head 24 7. That's a lot, even for the most powerful telepath. He can manipulate many minds at once, claiming to be able to control the whole world, but I think that was ultimately a lie. But with some training, I wouldn't rule it out. This guy is smart, but since he manifested his abilities at an early age and got no help in developing them, he doesn't have the best skill when it comes to using his abilities, which is probably for the best. He's pretty powerful as unskilled as he is, so it's in the X-Men's best interest to keep him at that level, unless he's on the team, of course. He does join the mutant nation of Krakoa in the end. Next up, Phantom X or Charlie Cluster 7 or Weapon 13 or John Philippe or whatever you want to call him was experimented on by Weapons Plus and was genetically grown and evolved using Sentinel technology. Now thanks to that he actually has or had three different brains for independent parallel processing. He had nanoactive blood and his primary nervous system is actually a detachable techno organism called Eva. So there's some stuff to break down there. Eva can fly herself and can generate bioelectric charges to be used as weapons with Phantom X being both telepathically and symbiotically linked to Eva. His multiple different brains allow him to think like a sort of supercomputer similar to Sage, but it also gives him access to two extra personalities, a charmer and a super deadly mutant hunter. He can create extremely powerful illusions and enter a trance-like state where he can rapidly heal, and he has self-supremacy over his own body and mind, which allow him to overcome
overcome pretty much anything to complete his missions, including mind control. He has enhanced senses, is a dope fighter, and does not create any kind of smell. And for the longest time, as a kid, I just thought he was like a glorified super soldier. I guess I was wrong. Did I include this next mutant because we share a name, and maybe more rare, the spelling of our name? Maybe, but that doesn't mean she doesn't deserve to be here. Amara, Juliana, Olivians, Akia, or Magma, is from Nova Roma in Brazil, but eventually ended up at the School for Gifted Youngsters. Her big thing is geokinesis. She can control the Earth's tectonic plates. Sure, is it short range control? Maybe, but the average tectonic plate is 125 kilometers thick, or 77 miles. That's no small feat to move that around and cause an earthquake or a random volcano. In New Mutants 12, she got essayed by a guy and was so mad she just poof, volcano in the middle of the beach. Good for her. The volcano magma lava stuff is called geothermokinesis. She herself has her magma form because the name magma had to come from somewhere. Well, in this form, there is nothing else hot enough to hurt her and she is physically super bright. She has fire hair too. She can throw lava while in this form and fire too, but the direct contact of magma seems to work better in her fighting style. If you come at her with metal anything, it will probably be a blob when you leave, she'll melt it. The place she grew up in, Nova Roma, was a secret Roman colony, so they did still do some of the training they would have done way back in Rome. That means Magma can fight real good with swords, if all that wasn't enough. If she's hurt, as long as she can touch the ground or something hot, she has regenerative powers. Next up is Sync. Sync has the mutant ability of power mimicry, meaning, kind of like Rogue, Sync can copy the powers of other mutants. But unlike Rogue, Sync has the benefit of not doing any harm to whoever he is borrowing powers from, and he can also do it without physical touch. Recently though, after being resurrected, Sync got a bit of a power boost, and he may even become a new Omega level mutant. In the story, Sync not only uses his normal mutant powers to replicate the abilities of the mutants Sunfire and Cyclops while they are both nearby, but it's also able to tap into Jean Grey's telekinetic abilities as well while she is literally all the way chillin on Mars. Sync's growth in power post resurrection was first noticed back in 2021's X Men number 18, with Sync documenting that he was now able to sync not just with mutants, but other superhumans as well, which is quite the power boost. And I think it just keeps going up and up. In the House of M alternate reality, Sync even got to the point of permanently retaining others' powers, which would be an incredibly significant power boost as well. As a main member of the new X Men, it's hard to be surprised. That he is getting some power boosts. Angel used to fly around and that was it. Well, not it. He and his wings were super strong so he could definitely hold his own in a fight. But soon, to put this simply, he got a good side and a bad side. The good side is Angel, the bad side is Archangel. Archangel is a persona that craves death and destruction, so Angel really had to get that in check so he could stay with the X-Men. Archangel did bring a bunch of new powers to the table, like a hypersonic scream. It's what it sounds like, he screams so loud it can cause internal bleeding which is fine, that's where the blood is supposed to be. To clarify to anyone concerned, that was a joke from a TV show. If you are experiencing internal bleeding, I would go to a hospital or get a blood transfusion from Angel. Yeah, Angel has healing blood now. Turns out, if you get hurt and Angel is nearby, you are good, you're good, you're safe. He can drip some of his blood on your injury and it will heal up quick. For him, he just heals when he gets hurt. Love a good healing factor. The whole Archangel thing gave him techno-organic wings, so like metal wings with a bunch of weapons and combat related uses that eventually go back to feathers. He's good at hand to hand combat and sword fighting and also business. He owns the company Worthington Industries and it's a fortune 100 company. Genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist. Jubilee's energy plasmoids might actually be one of the most potent of the X-Men's arsenal. The plasmoids aren't fireworks, even though they look a lot like them. They're actually closer to superheated plasma. She can create a bolt of bright light but she can also push out enough power to bend steel or like destroy a tree. And with precision, she can even detonate microbursts inside someone's brain. So that's the amount of range we're kind of talking about here. But that ain't all. Emma Frost once speculated if wielded properly, Jubilee could potentially detonate objects on a subatomic level, meaning this unassuming mall rat could like cause explosions of atomic proportions. She's a highly underrated character in the comics and gained a lot of popularity in the 90s thanks of the X-Men TV show, and while she's gone in and out of having powers, she still remains one of the cooler characters in the X-Men 
Surfers lineup who is much more powerful than you might assume. Coming in at number 10 today is the Silver Surfer. The Surfer was originally Norrin Rad, an astronomer from the planet Zen Law. When Rad discovered that Galactus, the devourer of worlds, had come to devour Zen Law's life force, Rad struck a deal with the cosmic entity to seek out uninhabited planets that Galactus could consume. Eventually, Galactus became aware of Earth, our little green planet, and he set out to make it his next meal. The Surfer arrived just in time to warn the Fantastic Four of Galactus's arrival, which was his initial reveal into the universe of Marvel Comics in Fantastic Four number 48 to number 50. And that started a great relationship between the Surfer and the superhero family. The Silver Surfer's adventures often center on philosophical conundrums as much as physical challenges, and Stan Lee has used the Surfer as a vessel to express some of the writer's own world views. But why is he on the list of ancient heroes? Well, we don't actually have a specific birth year for Norrin Rad, but the Silver Surfer himself has stated that it has been a millennia since he was first transformed by Galactus, and he was a mature member of his species when that happened. And that species is a long lived one, so it's very safe to say that the Silver Surfer is quite old indeed. Number 9, Mystique. To some of us humans, hundreds of years ago feels just as ancient as millions of years ago, maybe. The Marvel mutant known as Mystique, while you wouldn't think it, has stated that she was not born in the last century and that she's actually over 100 years old. Mystique has a very complex and unrevealed origin. Like Marvel started by introducing her and have only given us brief moments where she has shown up in the timeline prior to that. So this point is more so cobbling together various things she and others has said that point to her being quite freaking old. Mystique has been known to be with her wife, Destiny, by 1895 and she stated that quote, solitude was my natural natural state for a hundred years, which basically implies that she was born before 1800. In 1921 she met Logan in Kansas City and they all worked together in Scotland shortly before World War II, but in an early appearance in Uncanny X-Men number 170, Mystique dreamt that she was in the year 1783, which is specified as being 170 years before her birth. As the comic was published in 1983, this would make her 30 years old at the time of the story, but that has since been retconned. So as I said, it's a little convoluted. Despite the fact that it is unknown when exactly she was born, it can be assumed that Mystique was born in the month of September, because apparently her birthstone is a sapphire. While she might not be as ancient as others on this list, she is still much older than you think and an incredibly hard mutant to bring down. Number 8, Nabu. Dr. Fate is one of the most powerful magic users in DC Comics, but funnily enough, Dr. Fate is just a name used by the wearers of the Helmet of Fate, which was created by the powerful sorcerer Nabu. Nabu is actually billions of years old as one of the cosmic beings known as the Lords of Order. They came into being at the beginning of the universe and struggled with the Lords of Chaos for supremacy. The Lords of Order actually manifested themselves as the first sentient race in the universe, but it wasn't until 3500 BC, in Earth years, that one of the Lords of Order descended to Earth and became Nabu the Wise, an advisor to the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. In the New 52 continuity, he is a bit more human and credited as one of the first discoverers of magic, but regardless, after years and years and years serving pharaohs, Nabu did eventually quote, pass on, or it's more so that his physical body could no longer contain him and so his spirit was absorbed into magical items, mainly the helmet of fate, allowing him to live on through it and whoever puts the helmet on their head. Number 7, The Wizard. Mamoragan, or The Wizard, or just Shazam's origin story is deeply rooted in ancient mysticism and magic. He was an ancient wizard who once belonged to an order known as the Council of Eternity, sworn to safeguard the realms from supernatural threats. Thousands of years ago, during the days of ancient Egypt, Mamoragan was granted incredible magical powers tied to the six gods of Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, and Mercury. As the wielder of the magic word Shazam, Mamoragan could channel the combined abilities of the six figures, bestowing those powers upon a worthy champion. However, when his first champion, Teth Adam, aka Black Adam, fell to darkness, Mamoragan sealed the powers away for centuries. In the modern era, Mamoragan's essence endured, choosing the young Billy Batson as his new champion. When Billy utters the word Shazam, he transforms into the superhero Shazam, embodying the collective powers that Mamoragan once held. Mamoragan's origin story is a tapestry of ancient magic, responsibility, and the passing of the torch to a new generation of heroes who carry his legacy in the form of Shazam. He was a hero, but has kind of become something much more important. Number six. 
Hercules. Hercules is the son of Zeus, sky father and supreme ruler of the gods of Olympus, and Alcmena, a mortal woman who lived over 3,000 years ago. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, arranged for her father Zeus to have a half mortal son to be the world's champion. Zeus seduced the mortal queen Alcmena, pretending to be her husband, King Amphitryon, I think is how you pronounce that, and Alcmena gave birth to the baby Hercules. Now, as an adult demigod in ancient Greece, Hercules achieved worldwide fame as he became the greatest hero of the ancient world, best known for his 12 labors. As the Olympian god of strength as well, Hercules' strength is unlimited, making him one of the strongest and most powerful heroes in the Marvel Universe. As an infant, he was breastfed by his stepmother, Hera, queen of the Olympian gods, which increased his already demigod physiology to a godlike level. Hercules possesses the superhuman physical attributes of an Olympian god, but interestingly, some of his powers are superior to the vast majority of his own race. Most recently though, he is a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy, but he has also been a part of the Avengers, the God Squad, the Council of Godheads, the Mighty Avengers, the Secret Avengers, the Defenders, the Heroes for Hire, and of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. Number 5, Anthro. Created by Howard Post, Anthro is considered the first boy on Earth, existing in prehistoric times. He lived with his family during a period when the world was still in its primal stages. Anthro's curiosity and adaptability drove him to explore the challenges and mysteries of a world populated by both primitive creatures and nascent human tribes. Through his adventures, Anthro unwittingly played a significant role in shaping humanity's development and survival, often making use of his ingenuity and courage to overcome obstacles, while also being a part of some modern age stories thanks to time travel. He's popped up in Crisis on Infinite Earths, Armageddon 2001, Zero Hour, Team 13, and Final Crisis, and he's even been to the Marvel Universe where he interacted with Devil Dinosaur. Anthro's narrative explores the struggle for survival, the emergence of intelligence, and the foundation of human civilization. His story reflects the essence of human curiosity, resilience, and the quest for progress, serving as a symbol of humanity's earliest steps into the unknown. His powers are, well, pretty much non-existent, but he has played a part in some big events and in more than just the background kind of way. Number 4, The Ancient One. Born over a thousand years ago, The Ancient One, otherwise known as Yao, was a local to the Tibetan ancient city of Kamartaj. Under the guidance of the mystic sorcerer Kalu, Yao delved into the ancient arts of magic and arcane wisdom, eventually surpassing and even facing his mentor. After facing his mentor, granting himself long life and fighting alongside Sorcerer Supremes throughout time, he sought out an order of ancient magic users known as the Ancient Ones in order to devote his entire life to their goal of combating evil sorcerers. The youth eventually became even more skilled than his colleagues though and grew in power so great that he was the first mortal ever of Earth to meet with Eternity, the sentient embodiment of the universe, who presented him with the amulet of Agamotto and charged him to become their Earth's dimensions Sorcerer Supreme. After spending a ton of time trying to sculpt a successor and having multiple possible choices, Yao eventually passed on and left the Sorcerer Supreme mantle to Dr. Stephen Strange. Number 3, Eye Vampire. Vampires in DC Comics are practically indestructible and can regenerate any damage done by consuming blood. They have superhuman strength, speed, reflexes, stamina, can transform into bats, wolves, rats, and mist, and have enhanced senses and a bit of psychokinesis. But despite that, they do have some major weaknesses that pretty much everyone is aware of, with a big one being the frickin' sun, unless they can find a way to temporarily make themselves immune. But for I, Vampire, otherwise known as Andrew Bennett, the former 16th century English nobleman in Queen Elizabeth's court, he has a peculiar ability to eventually automatically revive himself after he is sent to the grave. Even if he becomes a pile of ashes from the sun, he has even survived the end of the universe. I don't know how that's possible. The ability is a bit of a mystery, even to Bennett himself. When he survived the end of the universe, it was at the will of the presence, leaving some to believe that this may be true in all cases, but that's not actually confirmed. Whatever the reason, it has allowed him to survive as a heroic vegetarian vampire all the way until the modern day. Number 2, Dream. The Endless, featured in DC's Sandman story, is a group of seven siblings. Death, Destiny, Despair, Desire, Delirium, Destruction, and the focus of our point today, Dream. These siblings represent fundamental aspects and forces of the Vertigo slash DC universe, and they are all immortal, 
ageless and nigh omnipotent. The parents of the Endless were revealed to be the embodiment of Time, father of the Endless, and Night, the embodiment of the infinite darkness that existed before the dawn of the universe, and the mother of the Endless. So it's safe to say that these beings are probably pretty ancient. Like 10 billion years ancient. They came from the beginning of the universe. As for Dream, or Morpheus, he isn't so much a superhero as we are used to, but he is an extremely powerful, reluctant hero. And his journey to that status from emotionless god to a being displaying very human-like emotions and characteristics is the fundamental story of the Sandman. Dream dwells in a realm called the Dreaming, from where he controlled the fundamental concept of fantasy and reality in the universe. As the line between the waking world World and the dreams is quite thin. And in a number one today, it's Hippolyta. This queen's history begins thousands of years ago, around 1300 BC. The Greek pantheon held a meeting convened by the goddesses. They were discussing the creation of a race of humans that would champion their ideals. The male gods, including Zeus and Ares, did not seem interested in this, and Hera did not wish to go against her husband. So it was left to the other primary female Greek goddesses. They decided to travel into the underworld where they came upon the Well of Souls, where the souls of all the women murdered by men's hatred were gathered together. The goddesses took these souls and went and dropped them into a lake in Greece. The souls mixed with the clay and the stone of the lake bed to form the Amazons, and the first one to emerge from the waters was Hippolyta. The goddesses appointed Hippolyta, or Hippolyta, however you want to pronounce it, to be queen, and they decreed that the Amazons were to spread the message of peace, tolerance, and equality by being super dope warriors. Yes, Wonder Woman is also pretty ancient too, but mama came first, so here we are. Sorry. Number 10, Quasar. Quasar is Wendell Vaughn, a being of pure quantum energy. When armed with his quantum bands, he is even more powerful. The quantum bands allow Quasar to create constructs and shields. They also give him the power to absorb energy and complete quantum jumps, effectively teleporting. Quasar managed to survive in a fight against Annihilus, attempting to teleport away before he was destroyed, but only managing to do so at the last minute with his mind. For a time, he'd become trapped in the negative zone mentally, ceasing to have a physical form, passing on the mantle of Quasar for a time to Philavel and Nova's Richard Rider after. However, Quasar's defeat during Annihilation would seemingly only make him stronger, as after a time he managed to somehow regain his physical form, returning only to go on a journey to the Cancerverse, acting as a scout for his own universe. Existing as a being of pure quantum energy means that Quasar is a powerful hero to go up against and might make him too powerful for the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the end. Good old Wendell. Number 9, Gladiator. Gladiator is one of those heroes whose powers are only limited by his own state of mind. Literally. Gladiator's confidence is directly tied to his power levels, and the more confident that he feels, the more unstoppable he becomes. For a time, Gladiator actually ruled his people as the Magister of the Shi'ar Empire, out in space. But more recently, he decided to step down, believing that Anaramani was needed on the throne and relinquishing his place to Xandra. Gladiator himself is Kalark, a Strontian, who went through an enhancement process to make him worthy of the rank of Gladiator. He is immensely powerful, being super super strong, fast, agile, invulnerable, and possessing a healing factor. He is capable of interstellar flight and is an incredibly gifted and experienced fighter. And friends, if you are liking this list and you want more lists like it, if you want that part three, I don't know if we can do one, but I mean, there's a lot of characters in the Marvel Universe, so I'm sure we can. Be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Black Bolt. Black Bolt is the king of the Inhumans. We probably won't see him anytime soon in the MCU, not just because you'd then have to explain all about the Inhumans and what they're up to, and because he's super OP and can wipe out most opponents with just a whisper, but because we already tried to introduce the world to the Inhumans via their own television series, and it did not go well. Black Bolt, however, still has some pretty cool powers, and the Inhumans are a pretty cool bunch, if we did feel that they might be a good fit. We just might have to tone down Black Bolt's powers somewhat, or maybe also find like another way to have them? I don't know. He was considered powerful enough to take on Thanos, and he even survived a one on one battle against him in the comics. He was able to shatter Thanos' armor during their fight, though his powerful voice did not harm the Mad Titan directly. Rats. He also seemingly killed one of the most powerful Omega level mutants around, Vulcan, who was on part one of our list. However, this was later retconned to not have actually happened, as we later learned during Hickman's reign over the X books that Vulcan actually survived the fight, apparently. 
he looked pretty dead. It looked like he was pretty dead, but he survived. How? We don't know. Number seven, Star Brand. Another cosmic hero who right now is in the care, I suppose, of the Avengers is Star Brand. Well, one of the Star Brands. There have been other Star Brands before in Marvel Comics, but this one is unique in the sense that she is just a little baby, or maybe more of a toddler now, actually. Either way, it would be pretty weird to see such a powerful young one fighting as a member of the Avengers, unless we're thinking of going the route of Baby Yoda, I guess, aka Grogu in Star Wars. Still, it seems Seems unlikely. Whether it's little baby Selby or Kevin Connor, it's very unlikely they're going to get either of the star brands out in the MCU. Their invulnerability, super strength, matter manipulation, energy manipulation, cosmic awareness, and healing powers may simply just be too much for the MCU to handle. <laughs> Sorry, star brand. Star brands. Number six, Hyperion. Hyperion is known for being Marvel's version of a literal Superman. Sure, we have Sentry and Captain America who are comparable in terms of their powers and their role, but Hyperion in the newest Heroes Reborn series seemed to be really, really exuding those Superman vibes. Here, Hyperion was the leader of the Squadron Supreme of America, an elite team of heroes who were also all kinda messed up. Hyperion himself seemingly had a god complex that perhaps was well earned considering what he was capable of. When all their enemies escaped their negative zone prison, Mark Milton as Hyperion was the first to respond, and he handedly took down pretty much everyone who got out, including Galactus, a version of Gladiator, a version of the Beyonder, a giant man version of Ultron slash evil Hank Pym, and a version of the Annihilation Wave. Granted, this Hyperion technically is an alt version, but either way you slice it, either way you dice it, any version of the hero is really too powerful and likely too similar to DC's soups to make an appearance in the MCU. Number five, magic. Teleporters always rank high on my list of powerful heroes because I think teleportation is super OP, and magic is definitely no exception there, although she is exceptional. So exceptional, in fact, if we didn't get to see her in the MCU, I personally would not be surprised. True, we did get to see magic appear in the New Mutants film, but that itself was outside of MCU continuity and canon, so doesn't count. Which is really unfortunate, as Anya Taylor-Joy was perfect in that role, and we likely won't get to see her take up the mantle again, which kind of bums me out. Magic is a member of the New Mutants, who is also known for being not just a powerful teleporter, but magic wielder as the ruler of Limbo. This is where magic teleports through to get where she is going. While in Limbo, she also becomes god level due to her attachment and relationship with the dimension. Magic also has a dark side known as Dark Child. While in her Dark Child persona, she becomes virtually unstoppable and generally a lot more evil. Number four, Nova. It feels pretty unlikely that we'll ever get to see any version of Nova show up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe at this point. Why? Well, because the Nova Corps were seemingly wiped out by Thanos when he went after them for the Power Stone. It's believed that all of Xandar was decimated in his attack, which likely means that the Nova Corps, who were there, were some of the first people to go. Unless there was somehow, I guess, a lone survivor who could become Nova in the future, it seems very unlikely we'll see any kind of character attached to Xandar or the Corps. This could be just what Marvel Studios was hoping to eliminate the chances of, though, with this plot point, as all versions of Nova are considered to be pretty epically powerful. Whether we're talking about Sam Alexander, Alexander, Rich Ryder, or Eve Bakian. Just all the Novas. They're just all pretty crazy. Number three, Blue Marvel. So as much as I really want Adam Brashear to come to the MCU, there is also a concern many have around the fact that this hero might just be too powerful to appear in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. At least as he is in the comics. Maybe if we toned him down? Granted, we have Captain Marvel, and now we have Monica Rambeau, who's pretty crazy powerful. So I'm really hoping I'm wrong about this one. But still, there is Captain Marvel and Monica Rambeau, and then there is Blue Marvel, who's kind of operating on a whole other level, due to the fact that his powers are derived from antimatter, and the fact that he is basically an antimatter generator slash reactor. And if you don't know, antimatter is like crazy powerful and crazy efficient um, in the Marvel Universe. 
I don't know about antimatter in real life. I don't even know if there is antimatter in real life. I don't know about that science. Number two, eternity. Eternity is not a conventional hero and more a cosmic entity, but like the Living Tribunal, they are also generally seen as a force of good. So, hence why I'm counting them on the list. Eternity is actually just below the Living Tribunal in terms of rank in the universe and is the personification of time. They exist alongside their sister, Infinity. Eternity is capable of manipulating time and space on a lucrative scale. They are immortal and are considered an integral part of the universe, existing alongside other major concepts which are also represented by powerful entities. Number 1. One Above All The One Above All isn't your typical hero, but they are a very powerful force of good in the MCU, like Eternity. One Above All is seen as the creator of the multiverse and all beings within it. They are basically the god of the multiverse, the ultimate creator. We talked about the Living Tribunal on part 1 of this list who is seen as the ultimate bringer of justice, the ultimate judge throughout the Marvel multiverse, and the One Above All is actually believed to be the entity that the Living Tribunal works for. One Above All is believed to be all powerful and omnipotent, getting involved in the matters of its creations only when its interference is truly truly needed. They were the one who made Adam Warlock take up the mantle as their new Living Tribunal as payment for restoring all of reality after it was destroyed. Which seems like a fair trade. They're like, hey Adam Warlock do this job and have lots of power and I will return reality. Just come work for me, you know? <laughs> I need a new living tribunal. You know how it is when the living tribunal dies. Actually, I don't know how that is. Sounds like a very rare problem. Number 10, Powerhouse. It feels weird to have Franklin Richards at the bottom of a too powerful or most powerful style list. However, while Powerhouse was once one of the most powerful heroes in all of the Marvel Universe, even becoming so when he was just a little baby, so much so that his dad, Reed, actually had to shut off his son's powers, he has been having a rough go in the comics over the last little while. Franklin was believed to be a mutant with the power to warp reality giving him access to a ton of extra power. But unfortunately, his powers have been on the fritz recently, and now he seems to have completely lost them. It's even believed that he was never truly a mutant, but instead subconsciously used his powers to alter his DNA, meaning that he can't even go to Krakoa currently anymore. I wouldn't expect us to see any kind of reality warping version of Franklin in the Fantastic Four film if we get a version of him there at all. Although honestly, depowering him in the comics may be part of a plot to have him come into the film. More more comic book accurate to who he is currently in the comics. Meaning production and writers wouldn't actually have to worry about his crazy powers and writing those in, which would likely get in the way of any massive threat as while powered, he could normally stop, well, just about any of them like that. No infinity gauntlet snaps, but just normal power reality warping snaps. <laughs> Number 9. Rachel Summers Rachel is one, really powerful, and two, just pretty unusual, which makes her a hard sell for the Marvel Cinematic Universe on both those fronts. Although the mutants will be coming soon, so there is a small chance, I suppose, that Rachel could show up at some point. Rachel isn't from the main continuity of Earth 616, but is the daughter of Jean Grey and Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, of her own reality, Earth 811. Rachel is considered to be Omega level, so in theory, the high level there is of mutant, although there are a few who threaten to surpass that level in the comics. She is an insanely powerful telepath, telekinetic, and can also manipulate time, even being capable of traveling through it. Rachel can also shield herself against time manipulation from outside forces, protecting her against alterations to the timeline. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists about all the cool things happening in the MCU, or not happening in this case, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8. Squirrel Girl It feels weird putting Squirrel Girl on this list, but she is weirdly one of the most OP heroes we have in the comics? Squirrel Girl is a hero who can pretty much defeat any threat she goes up against without usually even needing to fight. She handily defeated Doctor Doom using her influence over squirrels and defeated Galactus just by having a conversation with him and being overall fearless. Squirrel Girl usually befriends many other heroes and villains alike whom she meets which tends to be her secret weapon when it comes to winning any fight. Doreen Green is also a kind of odd hero so we likely won't be seeing her in the MCU anytime soon for that reason as well. But honestly, I kind of wish that we would. She might be odd and weirdly OP, but she's also had a lot of great moments in the comics and it would be really cool to see her cheerful, awkward, and infectiously fun nature come to life on the big screen. Number 7. Vulcan Vulcan is another mutant who is likely considered too powerful and possibly 
too complicated to show up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I know we are getting mutants so likely a lot of these folks could be showing up at some point, but I don't know if Vulcan's going to be one of them. Vulcan is not only Omega level, but is actually implied to be one of the few that I mentioned earlier who could potentially be past or at least at times surpass Omega levels. He is one of the coolest power sets in comics, which is also shared by other super awesome but perhaps less mainstream mutants such as Bishop. I love Bishop. He's another mutant that I would love to see show up in the MCU with the X-Men crew at some point. I mean, we did get Cable and Deadpool, so I feel like that could be possible. Vulcan has no limit to the type of energy he can absorb and utilize, even being able to harness magical or cosmic energy from the likes of Adam Warlock, although I do believe he does have limits when it comes to how much energy he can harness or utilize. Vulcan also can use his powers to reduce or even turn off the powers of those that he faces. Vulcan is Gabriel Summers, the mysterious younger brother of both Scott and Alex Summers. The one that for years we were like, does he exist? Why did Mr. Sinister randomly mention him and then we just never saw him? And then he finally showed up in the 2000s. He was like, hey, just been here all along doing other stuff in space, being real messed up. Number 6, Sentry. The Sentry would be an interesting character to have in the MCU because he is actually a hero who was retconned into existence. The Sentry is Robert Reynolds who was revealed to be a drug addict that was looking for a fix when he stumbled upon the Golden Sentry serum and accidentally basically became a hero. Unfortunately, due to the fact that Bob was mentally unstable, he ended up not just becoming the world's greatest hero, but also having another persona who was considered the world's greatest villain, known as The Void. When it was revealed that the Sentry and The Void were both Bob Reynolds, the heroes banded together to help Sentry make the world forget that he ever existed, which basically allowed The Void to also not exist. In so doing, Bob went back to living a relatively normal life, but when his memories began to resurface years later, he would return. Doing so would also awaken The Void within him, and it would once again be revealed, this time more to all of the heroes, that the two, Hero and Arch Nemesis, were actually connected and the same person. Number 5, Silver Surfer. The Silver Surfer is one of the strongest beings in the Marvel Universe. He is considered to be the most powerful of all Galactus's heralds, and despite usually being associated with that Marvel antagonist, typically acts as a hero, even choosing to stay on Earth for a time after coming to warn them of the arrival of Galactus. Silver Surfer is Norrin Rad, a hero who possesses the power cosmic, which grants him tons of astonishing abilities. The power cosmic is OP. He's also virtually indestructible, being immortal, invulnerable, and having a healing factor, even if you could hurt him. He also now is basically untouchable, being intangible as well. And that might sound like a setback, but he can still merge with other living beings, in essence bonding with them and using them as a host. So even though he can't physically touch stuff, he kinda still can. The Silver Surfer isn't just powerful alone either, he also possesses the power to bestow portions of his powers on others, which would have been really handy when everyone was dealing with Thanos, his army, and the Black Order in Avengers Infinity War. Number 4, Hope Summers. Hope Summers is the adopted daughter of both Cable and later Cable's wife in the future, who is actually also named Hope, but not the same Hope. Hope was the mutant Messiah baby, the first new mutant born after the events of M Day. And actually, originally, she didn't have a name at all. The baby would be raised by both Cable and Hope, only being given the name Hope Summers after her adoptive mother died. So she was basically named after her. Hope's mutant powers allow her to mimic the powers of others, managing to use those powers at their peak potential, even if she's completely inexperienced with them or unaware even of what they are or how they work at all. Hope's use of any powers she adopts is intuitive. She doesn't need to make physical contact to mimic them, she just needs to be in the area of the mutant who possesses them as well. Her own powers cannot be absorbed and she has a calming effect on others mutant abilities, basically helping to perfect and stabilize them. So Hope's also just a powerful character to have around if you're a mutant who's like, I don't really know what I'm doing. This makes her an integral part of the five, a group of mutants responsible for resurrecting fallen or lost mutants of Krakoa. Despite the fact that Hope's powers are believed to be restricted to the adoption of other mutant abilities, she and Scarlet Witch together rid the world of the Phoenix Force during Avengers vs X-Men. Now this is kind of weird because Scarlet Witch no longer is a mutant in the current comic book continuity, which could imply that Hope's powers mimicry is actually not therefore mutant exclusive. Unless something else was going on there and it was more like Scarlet Witch influencing Hope, I don't know, but I'm just saying if Hope was influencing any of that, that doesn't make sense if Scarlet Witch is no longer a mutant. Unless that's all a lie and that's going to be re-retconned away. Please, please do that. Please do that. 
Number three, Phoenix. One hero that it seems is really, really, really hard to get right when it comes to the films is Jean Grey. Jean by herself is already likely too powerful to show up. Although I will say, I think you can make that work if you just, I don't know, put more of a lockdown on her power set. However, if we are talking Jean Unleashed, Jean and her full potential, that's just not going to work. And if we're talking about bringing Phoenix into the mix and bonding Phoenix with Jean, that's also going to be a huge problem. Anytime you have a character like that who has the power to warp or manipulate reality, you're going to have a challenging time writing any kind of threat for them to face. As with what usually happens with Jean Grey, you can have the dark Phoenix come in and play villain, you can have Jean struggle to control her own powers and even struggle to maybe hold on to her sanity in the face of her powers, but a hero who happens to have control and be able to basically fix the world as she sees fit, that's a problem. It's like any villain you face, you're just going to be like, well, you're gone. You never existed. Done. Easy. What's next? Number two, Living Tribunal. The Living Tribunal isn't entirely a hero, or not a hero in the traditional sense, but is usually considered to be a force of good because of what they represent. The Living Tribunal brings a force of balance and justice to the cosmos and across the multiverse. While there are many different alternate versions of characters from each universe, there's actually only one Living Tribunal, which watches over all of the realities, getting involved when they believe an injustice has been committed and the scales need to be balanced. Of course, only if the injustice is super great. They're not just like, hey, I saw you littered, that's not cool, let's go to court. So not every injustice. The Living Tribunal was the one to call to trial a case of 1610, or the ultimate reality, versus the current main continuity reality of Earth 616. This case was about determining which reality should ultimately be considered the true main reality, as the Living Tribunal considered that the Earth of 1610 could actually be a good replacement for Earth 616. Fortunately, she hauled was able to convince them otherwise because She-Hulk is an amazing lawyer. Number one, the brothers. The brothers are a duo of cosmic entities who exist even outside of their respective multiverses, as each one represents either the DC or the Marvel multiverse. These two characters initially showed up in a crossover comic called DC vs Marvel, which already made it unlikely that we'll see them anytime soon in the MCU, because we would then need a crossover movie, which I don't think is going to happen yet. Maybe at some point. For a time, the brothers considered fighting one another in an attempt to acquire complete uniqueness, but instead decided, as they were pretty evenly matched, that they should appoint representatives from their universes to act as their champions. It's believed that the brothers are actually more powerful than the sum of their parts, meaning that even the living tribunal could be considered below them in terms of power levels and importance. While the brothers also have a male-centric name, the brothers, it should be noted that they're actually genderless. So. They're also kind of the sisters. They're kind of, they're just whatever. They're just called the brothers. They look like giant mechs, so you know. No bits. <laughs> I don't think. And at number 10 is Red Hood. Now look, technically, things have changed for Red Hood recently as he has finally agreed to take a less lethal approach to crime fighting, which is why he is at the top of this list. But even though he doesn't bring people to the end of the line anymore, he still leaves them on the brink of the afterlife, and it's debatable whether that is actually necessary all of the time. But outside of his recent developments, Red Hood is an incredibly lethal hero, with almost no qualms about taking the lives of the criminals he faces. And that will be a running theme for pretty much all the heroes on this list. Jason Todd began his time as the replacement Robin, but he had nothing new to offer other than being a bit rebellious, so you guys, the fans, got him savagely taken down by the Joker. Good job. It's actually kind of funny though, because when DC brought him back as the Red Hood, everyone absolutely loved him. Now, he's the black sheep of the Bat family, wielding his dual blam blams and constantly going out of his way to subvert the patriarch of that costume family by going far above and beyond the necessary limits. And at number 9 is Rocket. Icon is quite possibly one of the strongest Superman-like characters in DC Comics, and he is, in my opinion, kinda way cooler. But Icon would have never become Icon if it wasn't for Raquel Irvin, a teenage girl who inspired Augustus Freeman the fourth to use his alien powers to become a hero. And while she had no natural powers of her own, she used an alien created inertia belt to let her manipulate kinetic energy and to stand by his side as his sidekick, dubbing herself 
Rocket. As the human sidekick to an incredibly powerful alien superhero, Rocket needs to bring all the power she's got just to keep up. But on the side of being a superhero, Raquel is also an amateur writer, a high school student, and a single teen mom, all while living in the poorest crime ridden neighborhood in Dakota, Paris Island. She does all that and has the power to punch dudes through brick walls. There was even a time that she absorbed the kinetic energy of falling out of a plane and used it to completely destroy a whole building in one punch. So now you know I wasn't joking about her giving it her all. Number 8. Rocket Raccoon From one rocket to another rocket. Only this rocket wields absolutely massive out of this world weapons and is a four foot tall raccoon with exceptional tactical skill and a pretty creative potty mouth. Rocket the raccoon has had a fairly messed up past which I think is a common thread for heroes who don't really hold back. It gives them a bit of a cynical view of the world most likely. Now Rocket comes from half world in the Keystone Quadrant star system. Here a group of aliens built a massive insane asylum which then had its funding cut so they abandoned the project but left the patients with robot stewards to watch over them. Now these robot stewards became sentient thanks to a supernova and so they genetically engineered the animal companions of these patients to do the job that they were supposed to do, providing them with tons of equipment, weapons, and toy parts. Now this is where Rocket comes from. Eventually he went off half world and became an incredibly adept bounty hunter with Groot and eventually joined the Guardians of the Galaxy when Peter Quill put them together to face the Phalanx invasion. Being a little tiny raccoon means Rocket has got to compensate and he does that by being exceedingly good at his job and going completely all out on his enemies. In at number 7, Ghostmaker. In the same vein as Red Hood, Minoka Khan or Ghostmaker is another Batman adjacent hero with absolutely zero issue with using his katanas or pretty much anything he can find to usher criminals into the underworld. The difference here is that Ghostmaker is practically on the same level of proficiency as Batman himself. Bruce Wayne and Khan have trained under many of the same mentors and at the same time, being rivals since they were in their teens. Where Batman sees crime fighting as a duty that he needs to perform, Ghostmaker sees it as an art and this difference has caused them to go head to head on multiple occasions and eventually led them to vowing to just stay the heck out of each other's way. As Ghostmaker sees this as an art, he never holds back because he's constantly trying to one up both himself and everyone else and I mean honestly. Honestly, he's really freaking good at it. He has even gone into Gotham to clean up the messes that Batman couldn't handle, which is a controversial statement to make, but we can talk about that in the comments down below. Also, Ghostmaker is kind of hilarious. If you want to know what I mean, go read the comics where he is put in charge of Batman Incorporated. He's ruthless. And at number six is Hawkeye. Hawkeye makes this list for a very good reason. He fights alongside the Avengers, the world's mightiest heroes, and as Jeremy Renner made note of in Avengers Age of Ultron, he is a guy with a bow and an arrow. Hawkeye needs to constantly perform at the peak of his game and keep himself in peak physical condition just to keep up with his allies. And all the heroes want him on their side because they know he does actually deliver on that. But that's alongside the fact that he is constantly dealing with angry exes. Also, Hawkeye was originally and occasionally an assassin. Not holding back is part of his job description, which is why he was tasked by Bruce Banner with completely assassinating the guy while he was the Hulk by flinging an arrow into his eyeball. Sure, he felt incredibly guilty for this, but Hawkeye, an incredibly capable human, was the one who actually took the life of the Hulk. You can't do that and be holding back. And at number 5 is Moon Knight. Before Mark Spector ever became Moon Knight, he was already not entirely a great person. He was shady for sure as he was part of the CIA, but also put himself in illegal fights and weapon smuggling schemes, and he was even put on track trial for taking out the president of a South American country. He worked as a mercenary and it was one of the few heroic acts that he did, protecting an archaeologist's daughter, that got him mortally wounded and then revived by the ancient Egyptian god Khonshu in exchange for his servitude. Now as the fist of Khonshu, Mark would beat down criminals in the middle of the night while also living three other lives with separate personalities. Even though Mark is an Avenger, he consistently takes on his hero work by himself and constantly 
suddenly goes all out on the criminals he finds. Now, due to his split personalities, it's a little difficult for anyone, even himself, to say what he's actually capable of. Where one personality would never do something, another would do absolutely anything. And then there's also the influence of Khonshu that has made Mark abandon people to go and fight whatever battle Khonshu needs him for. Like when Moon Knight needed to fight the Hell Lord Mephisto when he wanted to take over the world. This street level hero took on a Hell Lord. You see what I'm saying here? But more than that, Moon Knight has been able to actually beat all the Avengers and has even been infused with the Phoenix Force. There's a reason that he's one of my favorite superheroes. Number 4 Midnighter For Midnighter, the thing that makes me say he doesn't hold back is his use of his survival implants. These implants let Midnighter completely and flawlessly regenerate from any injury and give him a super enhanced immune system which has allowed the guy to fight with a broken neck and other broken bones, actual holes in his chest and while being set completely on fire. Not to mention he's fought after contracting pretty damaging viruses including AIDS. He can also do this because one of his other implants allows him to turn his pain receptors completely off, allowing him to fight when the pain of his injuries would stop a normal person. It's also meant that he's been able to be completely awake and alert while he was undergoing major surgery. And that's pretty intense. The last of his implants grants him environmental adaptation which allows him to survive self sufficiently and without sustenance for indefinite periods of time in places like the vacuum of space. Now take all that and grant it to a guy who has absolutely no issue turning criminals into a bloody pulp and you've got a recipe for someone who never holds back. And at number 3 is Superior Spider-Man. Now while it is totally true that Spider-Man himself is known to hold back his power and pull his punches because you know greater power yada yada great responsibility that thing. This was not the case when his body was taken over by one of his greatest villains Dr. Octopus. When Doc took over the body of Peter Parker he unsurprisingly was not only unaware of the amount of strength Peter actually had but he was also unsurprisingly morally ambiguous with his use of that power. What do I mean by that? Well, the superior Spider-Man is pretty well remembered for a little thing that happened when he fought against Scorpion and completely punched the villain's jaw clean off of his face, ending his life instantly. There was also the time he went up against Jester and Screwball, two unpowered villains who commit crimes just for the thrill of it. For these two villains, spider Ock or Spock here used his fist to turn them into unconscious bloody messes. Spock also led an army of henchmen against Kingpin's base of operations and completely leveled it to the ground, completely destroyed the robot body of the spider slayer and then mocks him and he also completely knocked out Wolverine in just two hits for touching him. Hilarious. And at number two is Wolverine. If Andrew was here right now, he could probably go on a rant about how Wolverine notoriously consistently chooses the path of most resistance simply to show how tough he is. And yeah, the guy has an adamantium skeleton, one of the strongest healing factors in comic books and his powers can't exactly get out of control so he has almost no reason to hold back at all. He is well known for being one of the wildest most ferocious fighters in the Marvel landscape. No one wants to face this guy as almost completely guaranteed to end in their loss if if not their certain demise. In the Age of Ultron story for example, his very first solution to solve the problem of Ultron was to just go back in time and end Hank Pym's life before he could create the insane robot, which actually would result in a much worse timeline. Or there's Old Man Logan, when the villains coordinated an attack against the heroes and Wolverine thought he completely decimated a large group of villains when he actually took out every single one of the X-Men. The villains took advantage of the fact that Wolverine doesn't hold back to make him destroy his own teammates. It's a well known fact that James Howlett very very rarely holds back. And in at number one is the Punisher. I don't even really need to explain this one. Punisher is like the black sheep among all the heroes and even the anti heroes. He very much toes the line of being a complete villain. Sure his targets are almost always criminals and villains but sometimes they haven't been at all. Frank Castle took the life of Captain America as an example. He's famously the Marvel Universe and he did that while having the same handicap that Hawkeye possesses. The fact that he's just a guy. A guy with an absolutely insane arsenal. 
that he is not even slightly afraid to use. And if he ain't using his weapons, then he will use whatever else he has, including his own fists. There was even a time that Frank Castle in the 616 continuity used a steamroller to completely crush and flatten Wolverine in an incredibly overly aggressive comic. What am I saying? Almost every comic with Frank Castle in it is overly aggressive. During Civil War, Frank instantly ended the lives of two villains who were on his side as soon as he saw them. He doesn't hold back ever. I don't Pretend we have ancient Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider on a freaking mammoth? Are you kidding me? Back when Earth was an untamed land inhabited by tribes of cavemen, the young boy who would become the first Ghost Rider was brilliant among his pack, but he kept this to himself, fearing isolation. One day, a strange man confronts the tribe, swiftly becoming the leader of their pack through violent means, and eventually revealing himself to be a Wendigo before devouring the entire tribe, save for the young boy. Before the Wendigo leaves, he names the boy Ghost and challenges the boy to find him. With everyone he'd ever known gone, Ghost ventures beyond his cave, deciding that if the stranger could survive out there in the world, so could he. Ghost then embarks on a quest to survive and find his newfound adversary. Alone in a new turbulent environment, Ghost nearly succumbs to exhaustion, but at that moment he's approached by a talking serpent who bestows upon Ghost the spirit of vengeance as a means of achieving his goal, transforming him to the very first Ghost Rider. Fast forward five years and the stage is set for a showdown. Ghost on the back of a flaming mammoth confronts the Wendigo, engaging in a battle that ends with the Wendigo pushing Ghost atop the mammoth off a cliff, a fall that only the rider would survive. Alone once more, the ghost was approached by Odin and Lady Phoenix, who would ask him to join the prehistoric Avengers. By the way, if Ghost Rider on a mammoth isn't cool enough for you, then try the Ghost Rider of the Hyborian Age about 990,000 years later, when the Ghost Rider of that era rode a giant spider. The Spider Rider would go on to confront Conan the Barbarian, and while we don't know how that showdown ends, you can definitely bet it would be a battle of the ages. Well, the Hyborian Age specifically. And speaking of which... Number 9. Conan the Barbarian. Conan was born on a carnage-strewn battlefield in the hills of the westernmost region of Chimeria, all the way back in the Hyborian Age, aka around 13 to 10,000 BC. The fact that Conan was born on a battlefield was considered to be an omen that Conan would grow up to be a great warrior one day. And Conan was one of the most accomplished swordsmen of the Hyborian Age. He has unusually high strength, agility, and speed for a human. He has lifted immense objects or enemies, even using his his bare hands to bring down a raging bull when he was still relatively young. It's said that he has the strength equivalent of 10 to 20 men. More often than not though, Conan relies upon his lightning fast reflexes in combat situations and they've very rarely failed him. On top of that, he has a massive level of durability and through years of dealing with sorcerers, magicians, and witches, he has even developed a moderate level of resistance to magic and mind control spells. Conan is a master warrior. He has a hardy survival instinct, is a master of stealth, and is multilingual. While primarily known as a wandering sellsword, Conan progressively became a master tactician, leading entire armies into battle, and eventually, Conan even became king of Aquilonia, wherever that is. And also, eventually, a hero interacting with the heroes of the modern day. If you're enjoying the videos so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Moving on to number eight, we have Odin Borson. Wait, did any of you guys know that the Allfather's last name is Borson? Just me? Okay. Odin Odin, born from the union of Bor, the son of Buri, and Besla, a giantess, emerged alongside his brothers Kul, Vili, and Vis. I definitely butchered that, I'm so sorry. Together, these divine siblings embarked on a cosmic odyssey that would reshape reality itself. They dared to challenge Ymir the Frost Giant, forging the very fabric of the cosmos and existence itself from Ymir's remains. Asgard, the celestial realm, blossomed from the remnants of Ymir, becoming the abode of gods in the heart of their dominion. Yet Odin's exploits were not limited to creation alone. One day, a sentient and all-powerful storm known as the God Tempest threatened the sanctity of Asgard. Odin, as mighty as the storm was, stood resolute against its fury, and with a display of power that echoed through the cosmos, Odin quelled the Tempest, imprisoning its essence within a fragment of Uru, which would one day become the legendary Mjolnir, a symbol of power and worthiness. Sometime after forging Mjolnir, but long before the birth of Thor, Odin descended upon Midgard, then known as Aesheim, where he bestowed upon the world the gift of humanity. However, even the god's benevolence can be tempered with enigmatic purpose. Bor, his father was not entirely pleased with Odin's creation, casting upon humanity the mantle of suffering. As eons swept by, Odin's saga intertwined with the Stone Age. See, Mjolnir proved difficult to wield, leading Odin to forge an alliance with mystically empowered prehistoric humans. Together they united as the Stone Age Avengers, the guardians of Earth's fragile
exiled yet flourishing existence. Number seven, the immortal. Due to an accident that happened approximately 3,000 years ago, the man who became Invincible's immortal was exposed to an unknown anomaly that gave him superhuman abilities that put him almost on par with Vilchermites, making him one of three known beings in the universe that can make that claim. But outside of his incredible strength, speed, durability, stamina, and flight powers, the immortal is, you guessed it, Immortal, able to regenerate at an insanely fast rate, regrowing limbs and organs, not needing food, water, or oxygen to survive, and being immune to all poisons, toxins, venoms, viruses, bacteria, parasites, pathogens, and allergens. However, funnily enough, there is a way to quote, kill him. If the immortal's head is separated from his torso, it needs to be manually reattached for his healing factor to activate. But despite that, even when they aren't attached, he still remains perfectly preserved until the reattachment happens. He's been around for so long that he has been a knight, possibly under King Arthur as Lancelot, an explorer under or possibly as Christopher Columbus in the Spanish Armada. He fought in the American Revolution, became president of the United States by taking the alias of this guy you may know called Abraham Lincoln, and he he fought as a soldier in the First World War. In the 1930s is when he officially became a superhero and more recently became a member of the Guardians of the Globe. At number six is Phoenix. We begin with an abandoned infant named Firehair left to her own devices at a place aptly named The Burnt Place. It wasn't a cozy nursery, mind you, but a clearing where xenophobic tribes try to sacrifice anyone who manifested appearances which strayed from their norm. In this case, the child's red hair. The abandoned infant found herself being raised by an unlikely family, a pack of wolves. Wolves, the original guardians of the forest. Perhaps a canine paw father is what every superhero needs. One fateful day's fire hair solitude was interrupted by a floating man who conversed through thoughts. No need for that pesky small talk. This floating mentor, which fire hair fondly dubbed as the High Walker, introduced her to a congregation of adopted mutants called the Tribe Without Fear, offering refuge and training. Fast forward and fire hair's psychic abilities awaken just in time to sound the alarm about an impending attack from the xenophobes from earlier. As the High Walker faced off against the invading tribes, then Firehair's psyche is overwhelmed by the storm of human emotion. Sadly, the High Walker meets his end while trying to calm her. Firehair fainted as her fellow pupils gave into rage and fought the attacking tribesmen, resulting in the demise of everyone present, save for herself. Firehair blamed herself for her mentor and friend's demise and was overcome with despair, contemplating turning her powers on herself to unalive herself, returning to the burnt place to be eaten by buzzards. As she lay awaiting her demise, the Phoenix Force, an ancient cosmic entity with a penchant for turning planets into cinder, who had created the burnt place when it first arrived on Earth, bonds with Firehair having been drawn to her raw and untapped psychic power. Consumed by a vengeful rage, Firehair almost gave in to the bloodlust and became a dark phoenix, but she was pacified thanks to the one who had saved her as an infant, her paw father, if you will. From that day forward, she would take a page out of the wolf playbook and decide to protect the weak rather than lay waste to the universe. Realizing the threat that beings such as herself posed to the integrity of Earth, she began assembling a team of supernatural and mystically augmented heroes to protect the nation's humanity humanity from both outside threats and themselves, and thus founding the Avengers of the Stone Age. Number 5. Exodus Grand Duke Benny du Perry was a 12th century nobleman from medieval France in Marvel Comics. Does that count as ancient? I don't know anyone who's around then, so I'm taking it and running with it. What are you going to do about it? Nothing, because I'm just an image on your screen. As an adult, Benet was a crusader for the Knights Templar sent to Jerusalem during the Crusades, and he even became best friends with Eobar Garrington, aka the Black Knight of that era. The two had set out on a quest to find the Tower of Power, which is a stupid name. When his abilities manifested after an encounter with the Phoenix Force, which were then improved further thanks to the mutant apocalypse. But thanks to Big Blue, Exodus was trapped in a tomb until the modern day when he was awoken by Magneto and joined his cause. Exodus is one of the most powerful psionic mutants in existence, with such a pristine use of telekinesis and telepathy that he can even alter electrons and molecules. His power is so strong that Marvel even had to debuff him by making his powers dependent on his or others level of faith in this mutant. Although he still regularly kicks some serious butt. At number four is Agamotto. Now speaking of ancient superheroes, let's uncover a figure whose power and influence might just leave you spellbound. No, he's not your everyday magician pulling rabbits out of hats. We're talking about the cosmic conjurer who would give Doctor Strange a run for his money. Imagine being tutored by a deity, Oshurder no less, the literal elder goddess of Earth. But Agamotto wasn't just a student he went on to become Earth's very first Sorcerer Supreme. Agamotto would go on to face cosmic threats like the Fallen, and yes, 
even Dormammu, which he thwarted alongside the Stone Age Avengers. Now let's talk artifacts. The Legend of Agamotto was like an Indiana Jones fever dream as he'd created magical treasures that would make a dragon's horde look like pocket change. First off, we got the eyes, that's right, eyes, plural, of Agamotto. You might remember one of those as the pendant in Doctor Strange's possession that guards the Time Stone. Well, Agamotto made not one, not two, but three of them bad boys. But their intended purpose wasn't meant to guard Infinity Stones or serve as reading glasses. These peepers could pierce through dimensions, unlocking knowledge that could make Google's search engine blush. Ever heard of the Book of Vishanti? Yup, that was Agamotto's brainchild too. An enchanted book that's like Wikipedia, but for spells. Agamotto went from being a mere mortal sorcerer supreme to being a bona fide higher being, a principality. Essentially, imagine a being so magically advanced that you become a go-to power source for other sorcerers. Sort of like being the neighborhood electrician for the mystical realm. So there you have it, Agamotto, the ancient superhero who wasn't just reading spells from a dusty book, he was writing them into that dusty book, shaping the very fabric of reality, defending Earth from cosmic threats, and leaving behind a trail of magical breadcrumbs for future sorcerers to follow. Number three, Starbrand Vin. The Starbrand itself is an incredible source of power, proven by other people who have wielded it. The bearer of Earth 723's Starbrand used the power to create music that influenced human behavior to the extent that he has unified the people of his world as a single hive mind. Earth 541 is the home of a Starbrand bearer who has conquered his world and installed himself as the head of a benevolent monarchical dictatorship, but like a good one that actually somehow works despite the lack of freedoms. Thing is, what the Starbrand is capable of is dependent on its wielder's imagination. When it first showed up on Earth, it was millions and millions of years ago coming down with a meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs, but in doing so, it bonded itself to a Tyrannosaurus Rex, which is absolutely awesome. After a few millions of years though, that T-Rex had gone belly up, and the Starbrand found a new bearer in the form of a caveman named Vin. It's just VNN, I don't know why it's pronounced like that. Interestingly though, when Vin came upon the Starbrand and used it to join up with the Avengers 1 million BC, he was actually more analogous to like the Hulk, at least in his looks, and he had a more primitive use of the Starbrand than other future bearers. But he did live on the moon for a bit and help fight a celestial, so don't get it twisted, he did more than just punch stuff. At number two is the first Black Panther. Meet Mosi, a member of the Black Panther tribe in the legendary land of Wakanda. Now, he wasn't the first of his tribe to munch on the heart shape herb, but he was the first to survive the experience as he caught the attention of a powerful entity known as Bast, the Panther Spirit. And let me tell you folks, that wasn't your ordinary herbal experience. We're in ancient Wakanda after all, not modern Canada. With Bast's blessing, Mosi became the very first Black Panther. Talk about leveling up. It was around this time that Earth was dealing with some cosmic turbulence courtesy of a meteor from the Vega system. The rifts it opened up started inviting all sorts of extraterrestrial nasties, like the Brood, to the neighborhood. Not one to let his tribe become an all-you-can-eat buffet for these cosmic creeps, Mosi stepped in as Wakanda's defender-in-chief. And guess who else decided to crash the party? None other than Odin Borison, the Asgardian bigwig himself. Now, Odin wasn't exactly known for tossing around compliments like confetti, but he had to admit he was pretty darn impressed with Mosi's moral moxie. And if that was enough, get this, Mosi was the first person after Odin to ever lift Mjolnir, proving his worthiness during the first encounter with the rest of the Stone Age Avengers. Mosi and his crew sealed away a colossal celestial, saving the day like it was just another Wednesday. They faced off against cosmic villains like Mephisto and Shumagora, making your average supervillain seem about as threatening as a fluffy kitten. But alas, all good things must come to an end. Mosi met his match in a battle against the children of Lofi and Hive, and his sacrifice marked the end of this ancient Avengers era. The team disbanded with Mosi's demise and also caused the Wakandan people to retreat from the outside world, requesting that the Avengers forget their existence. The nation would then segment into tribes and were not reunited again until the rise of the second Black Panther, Alumo Bashenga. And finally, in at number one today is Mr. Majestic. DC Comics' Mr. Majestic, also known as Magistros, is a character of immense power and capability that often surprises readers with the extent of his abilities. Hailing from an advanced alien race known as the Caribbean, Majestic possesses superhuman strength, speed, and durability that rivals even the mightiest of superheroes. Unlike the lesser cast, however, he is a carabum of imperial blood, meaning he has a host of cosmic tier physical and mental abilities. Majestic has demonstrated the power to manipulate matter and energy at a molecular level, able to discharge any manner of energy he has on hand however he sees fit, rearranging the subatomic structure of objects, or charging his fists with energy to increase his punching strength. Speaking of strength though, he has rearranged most of the planets in the solar system by just 
pushing them from his own power, and has crushed graphite into diamonds in order to pay for a meal, which those two things are very, very different. On top of all of that though, Majestic is basically Wildstorm's analog for Superman and shares a lot of the same abilities as the Man of Steel. And when interacting with the rest of the DC multiverse, he's considered to be an alternate Earth Superman. Oh, and he makes this list because, being a caravan, he is about 10,000 years old. Number 10, Martian Manhunter. Well, we did get a glimpse at what Martian Manhunter could have looked and acted like in the DCEU through Zack Snyder's cut of the Justice League, we still haven't had Martian Manhunter properly introduced in the main continuity of the DCEU. Main continuity I guess for the cinematic universe. Unfortunately while Zack Snyder's cut was his intended vision for the film that he was forced to leave due to a personal tragedy, it's not considered canon to the DCEU. Although this could be retconned later depending on what happens in the Flash movie. Who knows, the Snyderverse could become part of the DCEU. EU again. Martian Manhunter getting the axe initially in the theatrical release of Justice League could have to do with the fact that he is super cosmic or a little more complicated than most heroes when it comes to his relationship with Earth, or it could have to do with the additional problem of his powers. Also Martian Manhunter is kind of just complicated in general, but in a good way. Despite the fact that Martian Manhunter like most other Martians has a fear of fire, he is still insanely OP when it comes to his powers. Also Martians might be afraid of fire, but it doesn't actually hurt them as severely as their fears would imply. It's a psychological thing. It's not like, like, yeah, and if you set me on fire, like, pff, I die, just poof, I'm gone. That's not a thing that happens. They just get burned, like we would. John Johns possesses powers of telepathy, telekinesis, super strength, super speed, durability, shape shifting, invisibility, self duplication, biofusion, and x ray vision, just to name a few. So, yeah. I feel like that could be a big part of why we don't really have him as like a main, a main part of the Justice League yet. Number 9, Batmite. Although he's somewhat mischievous when it comes to Batmite, he's still generally a force of good, or at least he tries to be. Batmite is Batman's number one fan and he idolizes the hero. Like Superman's mischievous imp rival, pal, and sometimes enemy, Mr. Mixie is Pitalik, Batmite is also capable of warping reality, or so it would seem. Later on, his backstory was further complicated when it was suggested that he was merely a hallucination of Batman, a character that represented the rational part of Batman. Man's mind and existed only in his imagination. It's still not known if Batmite is a true character who exists outside of Batman or simply a character who exists within Batman's psyche. Either way, he's a tough hero to include in the DCEU. Either because he's just crazy powerful or because it just makes Batman look really crazy and he's like a tiny little, like almost cartoon bat man guy. <laughs> and friends, before we move on to our next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like this list where we talk about the DCEU, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing may have gotten his own show very briefly as part of the short lived DC Universe streaming service, which has since been merged with HBO Max and basically no longer exists, but that doesn't mean the hero will be coming to the DCEU anytime soon. Which is a shame, too, as that series had amazing reviews, proving just how awesome the depiction of Swamp Thing can be on screen. Swamp Thing was once Alec Holland, a botanist who, after his lab was attacked, was set aflame while doused with his newly invented bio-restorative formula. Alec and his wife Linda had created the formula together. When he ran into the swamp, he merged with it, becoming a new sort of life form, a living swamp thing, if you will, which had also merged with Alec's mind. Swamp Thing is an elemental created in part by the green during its time of need. The swamp thing can connect with and control plant life, has super strength, is immortal, can resurrect, and can change size. There's a lot Swamp Thing can do. If I had a Swamp Thing ad where Swamp Thing was like helping you with plants, that's what it would be. Number seven, Zatanna. Zatanna Zatara is one of the greatest magic users that we have in the DC universe. She might be known for performing magic with phrases spoken backwards, but she's actually so accomplished that she actually doesn't even need to speak to cast all of her spells. Bit of a misnomer, although it is a thing we know her for. She can manipulate time, fly, or give the gift of flight to others, travel to other dimensions, heal, and much, much more more. She has knowledge additionally of various different types of magic including black magic and necromancy. I know we're supposed to be getting a film for Zatanna in the DCEU, like that's a thing that's going to happen, and that it will reportedly have its screenplay written by Emerald Fennel, the director of Promising Young Woman, but we still don't have the film yet and there have been talks of Zatanna's DCEU film for a while now, so you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm just saying let's not put the cart before the horse. 
you know what I mean? Despite how powerful she is though, I would definitely love to see Zatanna in action on the big screen. So I do hope the movie does happen. Not saying I don't want it to, I'm just saying, where is Zatanna? Why isn't she there yet? Is it cause she's too powerful? Probably. Number six, Green Lantern. Green Lantern is one of those characters that I'm still amazed we have not yet had in the DCEU. The Lanterns were teased in Zack Snyder's The Justice League, nicknamed the Snyder Cut, but we still have yet to really have them properly introduced in the DCEU or even included. It actually feels a bit strange to me that we have Shazam, but we have no Hal Jordan or Jon Stewart or Kyle Rayner or Guy Gardner. Like, what? This could be because Green Lantern is such a cosmic hero and so powerful that DC might be afraid any film they put the hero in simply would not work. Also, that's a lot of effects if you're going to space. And they have history with, you know, that hero on the big screen. He was initially played by Ryan Reynolds in a non DCEU related Green Lantern film way back in 2011. It feels like forever ago now, when the MCU was just getting off the ground and a few years prior to the start of the DCEU itself, with 2013's Man of Steel. Also, oh my goodness, if you go back and watch that movie, like you can see how hard Ryan Reynolds is like trying to be Hal Jordan. And I'm just like, you know what? He, he actually wasn't a bad Hal Jordan. I don't know if that's a controversial opinion. Number five, Damage. Damage is an anti-hero who is considered one of the strongest in the DC universe. The only catch is he can only transform into the unstoppable monster-like force where he has powers such as super strength, durability, invulnerability, magic resistance, and a healing factor for one hour a day. However, during that one hour, he's pretty much indestructible and unstoppable. He even proved to be too much to handle for Wonder Woman and later gave Superman and the Justice League a run for their money. However, he ultimately did end up being defeated by Dead Man in the end who showed up and possessed him for the remainder of his rampage hour, defeating him. Still, Damage is a pretty crazy powerful anti-hero that we likely won't see in the DCEU anytime soon. Likely due in part to how destructive he is, I'm sure. Number four, Orion. Orion is one of the strongest of the new gods and is also Darkseid and Tigra's son. But despite the fact that he is the son of Darkseid, it doesn't mean that he's inherently one of the biggest bads around. In fact, Orion is actually a hero, the exact opposite of his dad, but not the opposite when it comes to the power that he wields. He is also considered a new god, which means that he's insanely strong, durable, and pretty much inexhaustible in a fight. He is immortal and can easily take hits from Superman without really showing much sign of injury. Orion is also a gifted fighter and leader, and at one point, even even was able to lead an army in defeating the entire Green Lantern Corps, himself fending off Hal Jordan with one mighty punch. He's like, punch, I'm gonna choke you a bit, and then fight is done, goodbye, leaving. I'm rolling out in space. Number three, Phantom Stranger. The Phantom Stranger is pretty all powerful. Initially, we didn't even fully understand his true identity on New Earth, nor his powers, which weren't super clearly defined initially. What has been defined, however, is that the Phantom Stranger is extremely powerful and thus far seems mainly limited by the fact that he's not really permitted to interfere in the shaping of the universe, meaning he can aid in fights against universal threats, but not directly affect the outcome with his powers, more providing guidance than getting directly involved. While back in the New Earth continuity, there were many potential backstories for the Phantom Stranger, on Prime Earth, we know that he was once the Judas, who was famous for betraying Jesus in the Bible. His punishment following his death was that he would be unable to die, but instead would have to walk the Earth for eternity, making him virtually immortal. He became the servant of a voice that spoke to him, and with each task completed, he got closer to his own redemption. Though it has been thousands of years, and he still has not achieved his redemption yet. Number two, the Spectre. If we're going to talk about the Living Tribunal on our MCU version of this list, you know we gotta talk about the Spectre on our DCEU version. The Spectre is an immensely powerful cosmic entity who is often thought of as a hero, but has definitely had some methods to fighting crime that could be considered morally questionable? Like when he turned a man into wood and then sawed him into pieces? That's a thing that happened. Or when there was a guy that was afraid of fire and he's like, I'm gonna turn you into a candle and like melt you. That was also a thing that happened. I wonder when he turned that guy into wood and then cut him into pieces, if you could count the number of rings inside of him to tell how old he was, like a tree. Because the Spectre can do things like warp reality, that just means that he wouldn't really fit into the DCEU very easily, as we'd need some massive threats in order to give him any kind of real struggle. He would just be like, I'm gonna turn that person into wood. Now 
you're a candle. Now you're paper. I'm gonna cut you with scissors. That's all handled. Done. Next. Number one, Dr. Manhattan. Outside of the Watchmen film we had, which isn't currently considered as part of the DCEU canon, it's unlikely we'll ever see Dr. Manhattan on the big screen again. It's especially hard to have someone like Dr. Manhattan in the films because, well, he's pretty much always naked. Which means we either need to dress him up somehow, put him into an R rated only film, or have a lot of conveniently placed fruit baskets and props around in the foreground of each shot in order to censor him. Dr. Manhattan, though, when it comes to his power levels is one of the people responsible for creating the new 52 continuity. That's just how powerful he is. So to have someone who is capable of rewriting the universe in that way within the DCEU seems like it would be a lot. Unless, I suppose, if you're planning on completely resetting the DCEU continuity. Hmm. At number 10 is Terry McGinnis, aka Batman Beyond. In a future where the iconic Batman Bruce Wayne has hung up his cape, but fear not, because the Project Cadmus director Amanda Waller had foreseen this eventual outcome. She believed that another Batman would be necessary, and thus Project Batman Beyond was born. The plan was as audacious as it was ingenious, combining Batman's DNA from his battles with cutting edge nanotechnology. With the genetic blueprint secured, the only missing piece was a suitable family to raise a successor. Enter the McGinnis household where Warren and Mary turned out to be the perfect genetic match akin to Martha and Thomas Wayne. After a seemingly routine flu shot, they became the proud parents of Terry McGinnis, essentially Bruce Wayne reborn. Amanda even contemplated sending an assassin to ensure history played out, but that idea mercifully fell by the wayside. As Terry grew through his high school years, he found himself tangling in a street gang known as the Jokers with the dead. A chance encounter with an older, weathered Bruce Wayne on the grounds of Wayne Manor led him to a faithful partnership. Terry's assistance helped Bruce fend off the gang, and in turn, Terry discovered the hidden entrance to the Batcave. However, as fate would have it, Warren was taken out by the corrupt CEO Derek Powers, who had taken over Wayne Powers. Terry's pursuit of answers led him back to Wayne Manor, where he found himself demanding information and eventually taking matters into his own hands. He audaciously stole a Batman suit and confronted Powers, proving himself more than capable. If you're enjoying this video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Really helps us out, and I appreciate it. At number 9 is Iron Lad. The current big bad of the MCU was a hero at one point in his many, many alternate timelines. And while Kang the Conqueror has had more identities than there are timelines in the multiverse, at one point he was a protector rather than a conqueror. In the year 3016, Nathaniel Richards, also known as Kang the Conqueror, is saved by his future self from a lethal assault by bullies. This pivotal event alters his path towards villainy. See, Nathaniel is bestowed by his future Kang the Conqueror self with new armor and catches a glimpse of his future as Kang the Conqueror. However, instead of embracing this identity, he rebels against his future self and employs the armor to travel back in time to modern day Earth, specifically the 616 reality. Upon arriving, Nathaniel discovers the disseminated Avengers mansion, a result of Scarlet Witch's descent into madness. Despite his efforts to travel further back into time, he encounters the remains of Vision. And so by linking into Vision systems, he assimilates all of his programs, including a fail-safe plan to form a new team of Avengers in case the original team disbands or faces destruction. Adopting the moniker Iron Lad, Nathaniel Richards assembles the Young Avengers, modeling his armor after Iron Man. Later on, Kang returns to the present seeking Iron Lad, intending to send him back to his own time to prevent further disruption in the time stream. Engaging in a battle with the Young Avengers, Kang gains the upper hand until Iron Lad unexpectedly impales him from behind with a sword. Lord. This act leads to further reality disturbances, prompting Iron Lad to realize that he must accept his future as Kang the Conqueror in order to reverse the disruptions in time. Before returning to 3016, his memory is erased and his armor is removed. While the Young Avengers lose a member in Young Kang, his armor fuses with Vision's programming, resulting in a new Vision on the team. At number 8 is Future State Superman. Yeah, you heard me right. Superman is on this list. And I'm sure you don't need me to remind you how powerful Superman is in the present, but in the future state? Mm, not so much. Imagine, if you will, a future in which personal information is exploited to portray the Justice League, leading to their catastrophic breakup. And if that's not bad enough, Superman finds himself impaled with kryptonite, imprisoned in a kryptonite chamber, and subjected to bizarre experiments by a character named Mr. Toad. And if that's not a hefty enough dose of mystery, fast forward a bit 
Moore and Superman's son John Kent has taken over the mantle of Metropolis Savior, leaving Kal El to be trapped by Mongol in a grueling battle arena within Warworld. This leaves Superman completely depowered, forced to fight endlessly for his life until his inevitable demise, only to be resurrected by Mongol, pushing him to fight ceaselessly. But Superman's spirit doesn't waver. He becomes a beacon of hope, rallying other captives to rebel against their tyrannical master. At number 7 is Space Punisher. In an alternate universe, Frank Castle aka The Punisher takes revenge to a whole new level. Dubbed The Space Punisher in Earth 12091, his family's demise at the six-fingered hand ignites a cosmic vendetta. He later confronts a bizarre lineup of foes. Blood Queen? Brood Queen? She's history. Sabretooth and Deadpool? They're gone too, and so is Hulk. The quest leads to Avengers Planet, a clash with Jarvis and Galactus's gear, and an ultimate showdown with the Watchers. In this dimension, Frank Castle's transformation to The Space Punisher is a cosmic saga of retribution. At number 6 is the infamous Doctor Doom. Wait, what? Yeah, you heard me right! This Doom is a superhero. In the year 2099, the twist of fate has our favorite metal clad villain stepping into the limelight as a hero. And mind you, there's not just one, but three versions of Doom to shake it up in the future. Now, it might be a tad confusing, so buckle up. First, we got our Victor Von Doom that we all know and love, bruised up a bit with no scars and a hint of youthfulness. But there's also an imposter, Eric Cerny, lurking around with a villainous intention. A brainwashed pretender, if you will. And then, as a cherry on top, there's Tiger Wild, a cyborg ruler of Liberia, giving that unmistakable Doomish vibe with his metallic exterior and affinity for ruling with an iron fist. Now as the dust settles, the real Doom emerges victorious, and he ends up hatching plans to conquer the good old US of A. But before you label him the next tyrant, hold your judgement because his intentions are surprisingly heroic. On a mission to topple the mega corporations that have hijacked the nation, controlling every nook and cranny of existence. But Doctor Doom is pulling all the stops, using his genius and dare I say newfound heroism to reshape the future. At number 5 is Wave Rider, originally known as Matthew Wider, once a human scientist in a world ruled by the oppressive monarch. Monarch had eradicated all of Earth's superheroes and crushed the will of its people. Inspired by a childhood rescue by the enigmatic hero Bennett Dilly, Rider decided to fight back against Monarch's tyrannical reign. Throughout an experimental process, Rider transformed into the Wave Rider, gaining the ability to freely traverse time. As Wave Rider, he possessed the power to merge with individuals and glimpse their most probable future. Following Monarch's eventual defeat, Wave Rider continued to employ his temporal abilities to aid others throughout the time stream. However, his endeavors often brought him into conflict with the Linear Men, a group tasked with preserving the integrity of time. At number 4 is the Cosmic Ghost Rider. Imagine a future where the Avengers couldn't save the day, and where Thanos emerges victorious in a truly chilling way. Enter the Cosmic Ghost Rider, a character with a backstory that's as grim as it gets. Cosmic Ghost Rider was once Frank Castle, the Punisher. Yeah, that's right, this list is serving up not one, but two Punishers from space. He became the spirit of vengeance, only to return to Earth after it had been reduced to a lifeless wasteland. In a desperate attempt to thwart Thanos, he embraced the role of a Herald of Galactus, wielding the mighty power cost. Cosmic. But even this power couldn't undo Thanos' stranglehold on existence. In a shocking twist, Cosmic Ghost Rider switches sides, joining forces with the very tyrant he once fought. At number 3 is Bishop. Bishop is a mutant hailing from an alternate dystopian future. You know, it's not uncommon for mutants to have a thing coming from various bleak futures, but Bishop takes the cake. Lucas Bishop is a mutant from a dystopian future where he has time travel to join the legendary mutants he'd only heard legends of, the X-Men. In his original future timeline, mutants are confined to camps and the X-Men, along with Professor X, have all bitten the bullet. Bishop and his sister Shard were born in one of these camps and branded with M tattoos above their eyes for identification. Later on, serving in the mutant police force called X. SE, Bishop traveled back in time while pursuing a criminal named Fitzroy. Joining the X-Men, Bishop reevaluated his upbringing and found support and a sense of family among the X-Men. At one point, however, Bishop betrayed the X-Men after the birth of Hope, the mutant messiah who was believed to have caused the persecution of mutants in Bishop's future. I mean, Bishop's past, which is the future for everyone else. <laughs> time travel, am I right? At number 2, Booster Gold. Booster Gold, also known as Michael Carter, is a time traveling superhero hailing from the 25th century. Armed with advanced technology, he fights crime with the help of his robotic sidekick Skeets. His closest ally is Blue Beetle, and together they form a dynamic duo. However, due to his carefree and somewhat self centered nature, Booster Gold is often not taken seriously by his peers, leading to frequent underestimation. In his origin story, Michael was a talented college football player who resorted to gambling on his own games to cover his mother's medical expenses. Despite his intention to quit after settling the bills, his father compelled him to continue the scam. Eventually, he was caught and banned from football. Forced to work as a night janitor, he eventually robbed the museum where he was employed, stealing all kinds of time travel tech, and then proceeded to escape into the 21st century, seeking fame and fortune as a superhero. And at number 1 is Spider-Man 2099. 
Working for Alchemex in 2099, Miguel became increasingly dissatisfied with the corporation's control over the city. Pressured by Tyler Stone, Miguel reluctantly tested a genetic coding process on a subject named Mr. Sims, resulting in Sims transforming into a grotesque creature and passing away. Fed up with Alchemex, Miguel attempted to quit but was tricked into consuming a hallucinogenic substance called Rapture which bonded to his DNA. This substance was manufactured solely by Alchemex and Stone expected Miguel to remain dependent on it. And so in order to break free from the addiction, Miguel decided to undergo the same genetic procedure that eliminated Sims, using his own original genetic code as a baseline. However, his supervisor Aaron Delgado sabotaged the process in an attempt to eliminate him. Despite the sabotage, Miguel survived the procedure with his DNA fused with spider genes, granting him various powers and freeing him from his rapture addiction. 